Section 1 of 5 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Section 1 Betty. When I sit and hold her little hand, my Betty, then all the little troubles seem to shrink grow small and petty it does not matter any more that ink is spilt on parlour floor that gown is caught upon the latch and not the smallest bit to match the cook is going housemaid gone and coming guests to meet alone it matters not at all you see for i have betty and betty has me when i sit and hold her little hand my betty then all the simple foolish baby talk grows wise and witty i'm glad to know that pussy mow was frightened at the wooden cow i weep for dolly's broken head and for the sawdust she has shed i take with joy the cups of tea from wooden teapot poured for me and all goes well because you see i play with betty and betty with me when i walk and hold her little hand my betty then every humble weed beside the way grows proud and pretty the clover never was so red their purest white the daisies spread the buttercups begin to dance the reeds salute with lifted lance the very tallest trees we pass bend down to greet my little lass and these things make my joy you see for I love Betty, and Betty loves me. End of section one. Section two of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Two Calls Bo Philip and Bo Bobby stood side by side on the doorstep of their father's house. They were brothers, though you would hardly have thought it, for one was very big and one was very little. Bo Philip was tall and slender, with handsome dark eyes, and a silky brown moustache, which he was fond of curling at the ends. He wore a well-fitting overcoat and a tall hat and pearl-gray kid gloves. Bo Bobby was short and chubby, and ten years old, with blue eyes and yellow curls, not long ones, but funny little croppy locks that would curl, no matter how short he kept them. He wore a pea-jacket and red leggings and red mittens. There was one thing, however, about the two brothers that was just the same. Each carried in his hand a great red rose, lovely and fragrant, with crimson leaves and a golden heart. "'Where are you going with your rose, Bo Bobby?' asked Bo Philip. "'I am going to make a New Year's call,' replied Bo Bobby. "'So am I,' said Bo Philip, laughing. "'We may meet again. Good-bye, little Bo.' "'Good-bye, big Bo,' said Bobby, seriously, and they walked off in different directions. Bo Philip went to call on a beautiful young lady to whom he wished to give his rose, but so many other people were calling on her at the same time that he could only say good morning to her and then stand in a corner pulling his moustache and wishing that the others would go. There were so many roses in the room, bowls and vases and jars of them, and he thought she would not care for his single blossom, so he put it in his buttonhole and it gave him no pleasure whatever. Bo Bobby trotted away on his short legs till he came to a poor street full of tumble-down cottages. He stopped before one of them and knocked at the door. 
It was opened by a motherly-looking Irish woman who looked as if she had just left the wash tub, as indeed she had. "'Save us!' she cried. "'Is it yourself, Master Bobby? Come in, me jewel, and warm yourself by the fire. It's mortal cold to-day.' "'Oh, I am not cold, thank you,' said Bobby. "'But I will come in. Would you—' would you like a rose mrs flanagan i have brought this rose for you and i wish you a happy new year and thank you for washing my shirt so nicely this was a long speech for beau bobby who was apt to be rather silent but it had a wonderful effect on mrs flanagan she grew very red as she took the rose and the tears came into her eyes you little angel she said wiping her eyes with her apron look at the lovely rose for me is it and who sent you with it honey nobody said bobby i brought it myself it was my rose you see he said drawing his stool up to the little stove i heard you say yesterday mrs flanagan when you brought my shirts home that you had never had a new year's call in your life so i thought i would make you one today you see uh, happy new year happy new year to yourself me sweet jewel cried good mrs flanagan and blessings go with ye every day of it for your kind heart and your sweet face ah i had a sore spot in my heart this day master bobby being so far from my own people but it's you have taken it away this minute with your sweet rose and your bright smile see now till i put it in my best chiny teapot ain't that lovely now isn't it cried beau bobby and it makes the whole room sweet i am enjoying my call very much mrs flanagan aren't you <laughs> that i am said mrs flanagan with all my heart End of two calls. Section three of five minute stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five minute stories by Laura E. Richards. A New Year Song When the year is new, my dear, when the year is new, let us make a promise here, little I and you, not to fall a quarrelling over every tiny thing, but sing and smile, smile and sing, all the glad year through. As the year goes by, my dear, as the year goes by, let us keep our sky swept clear, little you and I, Sweep up every cloudy scowl, every little thunder growl, and live and laugh, laugh and live, neath a cloudless sky. When the year is old, my dear, when the year is old, let us never doubt or fear, though the days grow cold. Loving thoughts are always warm, many hearts no ne'er a storm. Come ice and snow so love's dear glow turn all our grey to gold end of a new year song section four of five minute stories by laura e richards this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. New Year. The little sweet child tied on her hood and put on her warm cloak and mittens. I am going to the wood, she said, to tell the creatures all about it. They cannot understand about Christmas, Mama says, and of course she knows, but I do think they ought to know about New Year. Out in the wood the snow lay light and powdery on the branches, but under the foot it made a firm, smooth floor, 
over which the child could walk lightly without sinking in she saw other footprints besides her own tiny bird tracks little hopping marks which showed where a rabbit had taken his way traces of mice and squirrels and other little wild wood beasts the child stood under a great hemlock tree and looked up toward the clear blue sky which shone far away beyond the dark treetops she spread her hands abroad and called happy new year happy new year to everybody in the wood and all over the world a rustling was heard in the hemlock branches and a striped squirrel peeped down at her what do you mean by that little child he asked and then from all around came other squirrels came little field mice and hares swiftly leaping and all the winter birds titmouse and snowbird and many another and they all wanted to know what the child meant by her greeting for they had never heard the words before it means that god is giving us another year said the child four more seasons each lovelier than the last just as it was last year flowers will bud and then they will blossom and then the fruit will hang all red and golden on the branches for birds and men and little children to eat and squirrels too cried the chipmunk eagerly of course said the child squirrels too and every creature that lives in the good green wood and this is not all we can do over again the things we tried to do last year and perhaps failed in doing we have another chance to be good and kind to do little loving things that help and to cure ourselves of doing naughty things our hearts can have lively new seasons like the flowers and trees and all the sweet things that grow and bear leaves and fruit i thought i would come and tell you all this because sometimes one does not think of things till one hears them from another's lips are you glad i came if you are glad say happy new year each in his own way i say it to you all now in my way happy new year happy new year such a noise as broke out then had never been heard in the wood since the oldest hemlock was a baby and that was a long time ago chirping twittering squeaking clattering the wood doves lit on the child's shoulder and cooed in her ear and she knew just what they said the squirrels made a long speech and meant every word of it which is more than people always do the field mouse said that she was going to turn over a new leaf the very biggest cabbage leaf she could find while the titmouse invited the whole company to dine with him a thing he had never done in his life before when the child turned to leave the wood the joyful chorus followed her and she went smiling home and told her mother all about it and mother she said i should not be surprised if they had got a little bit of christmas after all along with their new year end of new year section 5 of 5 minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Larry Wilson. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Lesson Song. Oranges and apples and baby's ball are round, and my pretty picture book that is square I found. And an egg is oval, and the corners all, when you take them by themselves, triangles they call. I am perpendicular when I stand up straight, I am horizontal when in bed I wait and from sitting quite erect if i chance to swerve then my rounded shoulders make what is called a curve see a sheet of paper i roll together neat straight and smooth and then i have a cylinder complete but if i thus widen out either end alone look it makes a different thing that is called a cone points there are a many on my pencil one two on mother's scissors five a star has on and our doggie has one right upon his nose and my dancing master says children point your toes oh 
the world of wonders is so very full how can little children learn half enough in school i must look about me everywhere i go keep my eyes awake and wise there's such a lot to know end of a lesson song section six of five minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Rubber Baby. The ascent of the rubber baby took place in the backyard on the afternoon of last 4th of July. It was an occasion of great interest. We were all in the yard Mama, Papa, Tubby, Toots, Posy, Bunny, Bay, and Mr. Bagabave this boy has another name but he prefers mr bagabave because he made it himself there was also the best cousin who is nine feet tall more or less and a kind gentleman who was a friend of the best cousin and came to see that he did not hurt himself with the firecrackers well there we all were and we fired crackers and torpedoes the whole afternoon without stopping the best cousin and the kind gentleman did it to amuse the children and the rest of us did it to amuse ourselves we had cannon crackers a foot long we had double headers which papa threw up in the air oh ever so far so that they exploded long before they reached the ground then there were dear little crackers very small and slender just made for bay though it is quite strange that the chinese people should have known about her when she is so very young now we fired off single crackers great and small with a bang and a bang and a bang bang then we put a whole bunch under a barrel and they went snap crack crickety crackety yes it was delightful but papa who has lived long and fired many crackers began to pine for something new and he said let us have an ascension then we took counsel and mr bagabave said we will send up the rubber baby now the rubber baby belonged to bay and she loved him but when bunny and mr bagabave told her what a fine thing it was to get up in the world and how many people would like to go up farther than the rubber baby would go bay consented and went and brought the rubber baby who smiled and thought little of the matter then papa brought the biggest cannon cracker of all and made a long fuse for it and set it up in the ground and over it he put a tomato can and on the tomato can he set the rubber baby now it was all ready and we all stood waiting for the final moment i do not know what were the thoughts of the rubber baby at this moment but we were all in a state of great excitement get out of the way children cried papa run away bay get behind the maple tree mr bagabave she's going now then one two three and away and papa touched off the fuse a moment of great suspense a tremendous report a dense cloud of smoke up soared the rubber baby higher than the top of the big maple tree almost to the very clouds or so bay thought we watched in silent rapture then as the intrepid air traveller came down still smiling a loud cheer broke from the whole crowd no not from the whole crowd there was one exception the kind gentleman who came to keep the best cousin from hurting himself gave a howl so loud and clear that we all started and ran to see what was the matter the poor gentleman had been holding a cannon cracker which he was going to fire just when papa gave the signal for sending off the rubber baby in the excitement of the moment he forgot the cannon cracker and it went off in his hand and burnt him quite badly we were all very sorry not only for the poor gentleman's own sake but because now there was no one to see that the best cousin did not hurt himself a pretty young lady came and tied up the poor gentleman's hand so nicely with her soft handkerchief that he said he was glad the cracker had gone off in it 
The rubber baby said nothing, but sat still in the middle of the gravel walk. Perhaps it was waiting to see if some lovely young lady would come to cheer and comfort it. But no one came till little Bay took it up, wiped off the dust and powder, kissed it, and put it to bed. End of The Rubber Baby Section 7 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The Red, White, and Blue Dorothy was all dressed to see the Fourth of July procession. She had on her white dress, her blue sash, and her red shoes. Her cheeks were red, too, and her eyes were blue, and when she pushed up her full muslin sleeves, she saw how white her fat little arms were as soon as you got past the sunburn. I's red, white, and blue myself," said Dorothy. She went and stood on the top doorstep, which was very near the street. Pretty soon the trumpets began to sound, and the drums to beat, first far away, then nearer and nearer. At last the procession came round the corner, first the drum major, with his huge bearskin cap, tossing his great gilded stick about. Then came the musicians, puffing away with might and main at their great brass horns and trumpets, and banging away at their drums and kettle drums. It was a splendid noise, but they were really playing a tune, the red, white, and blue. The standard-bearer dipped his flag as he passed Dorothy's house, for there was a great flag draped over the doorway, and red, white, and blue streamers running up to the windows, and Dorothy waved the little flag as she stood on the top doorstep. Three cheers for the red, white, and blue, sang the soldiers as they marched by. Thank you, said Dorothy, spreading out her frock and patting her sash. I's the red, white, and blue. See mine sash? The soldiers laughed and cheered. Then came a soldier who looked straight up at Dorothy and held out his arms, though without stopping. And it was Dorothy's own papa. In less than half a minute, Dorothy was in his arms, and he had caught her up and put her on his shoulder. Dorothy waved her flag, and jumped up and down on papa's shoulder and cried, Three cheers for the red, white, and blue! Three cheers for me! And all the soldiers shouted and cheered and laughed, and so Dorothy and the procession went on their way all through the village. End of The Red, White, and Blue Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 8 of 5-Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Totty's Christmas. They call me Totty because I am small. I had a funny Christmas and Mama said I might tell about it. I have the scarlet fever, and I live all alone with my mamma in her room. Nobody comes in except the doctor, and he says he shan't come any more to see a girl who feels as well as I do. Mamma wears a cap and an apron, and we have our own dishes, just like play, and she washes them in a bright tin pan. And then I have the pan for a drum, and beat on it till she says she shall fly. I always stop then for I do think I should be frightened to see Mamma fly. Besides, she might fly away. 
well yesterday was christmas and i could get out of bed and sit up in a chair it was the first time so i sat up to dinner and it was a partridge but we played it was a turkey there was jelly and macaroni and for dessert we had grapes and oranges mamma made it all look pretty and papa gave her roses through the door and she put them all over the table while she had washed the dishes she turned the big chair round so i could look out of the window and hal and john came out on the lawn and made a snowman for me to look at it was a fine man with two legs and two arms and they kept playing he was the british and knocking his head off mamma told me i mustn't turn round till she said i might but i didn't want to anyhow the man was so funny i heard papa whispering at the door and i did want to see him but i knew i couldn't cause the other children haven't had the fever and then i heard things rustle paper and something soft like brushing clothes they went on rustling oh a long time and there was jingling too and i began to want to turn round very much indeed but i didn't of course cause i said i wouldn't at last mamma came up softly and tied something over my eyes and told me to wait just a minute and it really did not seem as if i could then she turned the chair round and took the thing off my eyes and what do you think was there a christmas tree a dear little ducky tree just about as big as i am and all lighted with red and blue candles and silver stuff hanging like fringe from the branches and real icicles no mamma says they are like glass but they look real they are in a box now and i can play with them and everything on the tree was for me that makes a rhyme i often make them there was a lovely doll all china with clothes to take off and put on with buttons and buttonholes and everything i have named her christine because that is the most like christmas of any name i know and a tin horse and cart and a box of blocks and a lovely white china slate to draw on and a box of bees not painted all carved just like real bees and a magnet box with three ducks and two swans and four goldfish and a little boat all made of tin and lots of oranges and a lovely china box full of cream candy the doctor said i might have it if aunt may made it and she did and a box of guava jelly and a little angel at the top flying all of white china and everything will wash except the things to eat cause everything i play with has to be burned up unless it can be washed so they all give me washing things even christine has china hair and all her clothes are white so that they can be boiled and so can she and mamma says it won't hurt her at all so i never had a nicer christmas though of course i wanted the other children but then i had mamma and of course they wanted her poor dears and nobody need be afraid to read the story cause it is going to be baked in the oven before it is printed end of toti's christmas section 9 of 5 minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruhi hak 5 minute stories by laura e richards a certain boy i know a little bright eyed boy who lives not far away and though he is his mother's joy he plagues her too they say for when his task he's bid to do he sits him down and cries boo hoo i can't i can't i can't i can't i can't yes whether he's to practice well or do his horrid sums or hippopotamus to spell or clean to wash his thumbs it matters not for with a frown the corners of his mouth go down i can't i can't i can't i can't i can't 
oh what a joyful day it will be for mother and for son when smiling looks they both shall see beneath the smiling sun for in his heart he knows tis stuff and knows that if he tries enough he can he can he can he can he can end of a certain boy section 10 of 5 minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruhi hak 5 minute stories by laura e richards the new sister look carefully said the kind nurse turning down a corner of the flannel blanket don't touch her dears but just look the children stood on tiptoe and peeped into the tiny red face they were frightened at first the baby was so very small but johnny took courage in a moment hasn't she got any eyes he asked or is she like kittens yes she has eyes and very bright ones but she's fast asleep now look at her little hands whispered lily aren't they lovely oh i wish i could give her a hug not yet said nurse she's too tender to be hugged but mamma sends word that you may give her something a name she wants you and johnny to choose the baby's name only it must not be either jemima kezia or karen hapok the nurse went back into mamma's room and left johnny and lily staring at each other too proud and happy to speak at first let's sit right down on the floor and think said john so down they sat i think claribel is a lovely name said lily after a pause don't you no replied johnny it's too girly but baby is a girl i don't care she needn't have such a very girly name how do you like ellen oh johnny why everybody's named ellen we don't want her to be just like everybody now seraphina is not common i should hope not i should need a mouth a yard wide to say it what do you think of bessie oh bessie is very well only well i should be always thinking of bessie jones and you know she isn't very nice i'll tell you what johnny suppose we call her vesta geneva after the girl papa told us about yesterday lily you are a perfect silly why i wouldn't be seen with a sister called that i think polly is a nice name jolly kind of name well i don't you didn't get mad if you don't cross patch you're perfectly horrid john brown i shan't play with you any more much i care silly lily well said nurse coming in again what is the name to be dears mamma is anxious to know two heads hung very low and two pairs of eyes sought the floor and stayed there shall i tell you and good nurse went on taking no notice what i thought would be a very nice name for baby oh yes yes do tell us cause we can't get the right one well i thought your mother's name mary would be the very best name in the world what do you think why of course it would we never thought of that oh thank you nurse cried both voices joyously dear nurse will you tell mamma please nurse nodded and went away smiling and lily and john looked sheepishly at each other i i will play with you if you like johnny dear all right lil end of the new sister section 11 of 5 minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Buttercup Gold. Oh, the cupperty butts, 
and oh the cupperty butts out in the meadow shining under the trees and sparkling over the lawn millions and millions of them each one a bit of purest gold from mother nature's mint jessie stood at the window looking out at them and thinking as she often had thought before that there were no flowers so beautiful cupperty butts she had been used to call them when she was a wee baby girl and could not speak without tumbling over her words and mixing them up in the queerest fashion and now that she was a very great girl actually six years old they were still cupperty butts to her and would never be anything else she said there was nothing she liked better than to watch the lovely golden things and nod to them as they nodded to her but this morning her little face looked anxious and troubled and she gazed at the flowers with an intent and inquiring look as if she had expected them to reply to her unspoken thoughts what these thoughts were i am going to tell you half an hour before she had called to her mother who was just going out and begged her to come and look at the cupperty butts they are brighter than ever mamma do just come and look at them golden 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 there must be fifteen thousand million dollars worth of gold just on the lawn i should think and her mother pausing to look out said very sadly ah my darling if i only had this day a little of that gold what a happy woman i should be and then the good mother went out and there little jessie stood gazing at the flowers and repeating the words to herself over and over again if i only had a little of that gold she knew that her mother was very very poor and had to go out to work every day to earn food and clothes for herself and her little daughter and the child's tender heart ached to think of the sadness in the dear mother's look and tone suddenly jessie started and the sunshine flashed into her face why she exclaimed why shouldn't i get some of the gold from the cupperty butts i believe i could get some perfectly well when mamma wants to get the juice out of anything meat or fruit or anything of that sort she just boils it and so if i should boil the cupperty butts wouldn't all the gold come out of course it would oh joy how pleased mamma will be jessie's actions always followed her thoughts with great rapidity in five minutes she was out on the lawn with a huge basket beside her pulling away at the buttercups with might and main oh how small they were and how long it took even to cover the bottom of the basket but jessie worked with a will and at the end of an hour she had picked enough to make at least a thousand dollars as she calculated that would do for one day she thought and now for the grand experiment before going out she had with much labor filled the great kettle with water so now the water was boiling and she had only to put the buttercups in and put the cover on when this was done she sat as patiently as she could trying to pay attention to her knitting and not to look at the clock oftener than every two minutes they must boil for an hour she said and by that time all the gold will have come out well the hour did pass somehow or other though it was a very long one and at eleven o'clock jessie with a mighty effort lifted the kettle from the stove and carried it to the open door that the fresh air might cool the boiling water at first when she lifted the cover such a cloud of steam came out that she could see nothing but in a moment the wind blew the steam aside and then she saw oh poor little jessie she saw a mass of weeds floating about in a quantity of dirty greenish water and that was all not the smallest trace of gold even in the buttercups themselves was to be seen poor little jessie she tried hard not to cry but it was a bitter disappointment the tears came rolling down her cheeks faster and faster till at length she sat down by the kettle and burying her face in her apron sobbed as if her heart would break presently through her sobs she heard a kind voice saying what is the matter little one why do you cry so bitterly she looked up and saw an old gentleman with white hair and a bright cheery face standing by her at first jessie could say nothing but oh the cupperty butts oh the cupperty butts but of course the old gentleman didn't know what she meant by that 
So, as he urged her to tell him about her trouble, she dried her eyes and told him the melancholy little story, how her mother was very poor and said she wished she had some gold, and how she herself had tried to get the gold out of the buttercups by boiling them. I was so sure I could get it out, she said, and I thought Mama would be so pleased, and now... Here she was very near breaking down again. But the gentleman patted her head and said cheerfully, Wait a bit, little woman. Don't give up the ship yet. You know that gold is heavy, very heavy indeed. And if there were any, it would be at the very bottom of the kettle, all covered with the weeds, so that you could not see it. I should not be at all surprised if you found some after all. Run into the house and bring me a spoon with a long handle, and we will fish in the kettle and see what we can find. Jessie's face brightened, and she ran into the house. If anyone had been standing near just at that moment, I think it is possible that he might have seen the old gentleman's hand go into his pocket and out again very quickly, and might have heard a little splash in the kettle. But nobody was near, so, of course, I cannot say anything about it. At any rate, when Jessie came out with the spoon, he was standing with both hands in his pockets, looking in the opposite direction. He took the great iron spoon and fished about in the kettle for some time. At last there was a little clinking noise, and the old gentleman lifted the spoon. Oh, wonder and delight! In it lay three great broad shining pieces of gold. Jessie could hardly believe her eyes. She stared and stared, and when the old gentleman put the gold into her hand, she stood still as if in a happy dream, gazing at it. Suddenly she started, and remembered that she had not thanked her kindly helper. She looked up and began, Thank you, sir. But the old gentleman was gone. Well, the next question was, How could Jessie possibly wait till twelve o'clock for her mother to come home? Knitting was out of the question. She could do nothing but dance and look out of window, and look out of window and dance, holding the precious coins tight in her hand. At last a well-known footstep was heard outside the door, and Mrs. Gray came in, looking very tired and worn. She smiled, however, when she saw Jessie, and said, Well, my darling, I am glad to see you looking so bright. How has the morning gone with my little housekeeper? Oh, mother, cried Jessie, hopping about on one foot. It has gone very well. Oh, very, very, very well. Oh, my mother dear, what do you think I have got in my hand? What do you think? Oh, what do you think? And she went dancing round and round, till poor Mrs. Gray was quite dizzy with watching her. At last she stopped, and holding out her hand, opened it and showed her mother what was in it. Mrs. Gray was really frightened. Jessie, my child, she cried, where did you get all that money? Out of the cupperty butts, Mama, said Jessie out of the cupperty butts, and it's all for you, every bit of it. Dear Mama, now you will be happy, will you not? Jessie, said Mrs. Gray, have you lost your senses, or are you playing some trick on me? Tell me all about this at once, dear child, and don't talk nonsense. But it isn't nonsense, Mama, cried Jessie, and it did come out of the cupperty butts. And then she told her mother the whole story. The tears came into Mrs. Gray's eyes, but they were tears of joy and gratitude. Jessie, dear, she said, when we say our prayers at night, let us never forget to pray for that good gentleman. May heaven bless him and reward him, for if it had not been for him, Jessie, dear, I fear you would never have found the buttercup gold. End of Buttercup Gold Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 12 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. 
Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards One Afternoon Papa and Mama went out to row and left us alone at home, you know, Roderick, James, and me. My dears, they said, now play with your toys, like dear little, good little, sweet little boys, and we will come home to tea. We played with our toys the longest while. We built up the blocks for nearly a mile, Roderick, James, and I. But when they came tumbling down, alas, they fell right against the looking-glass. Oh, how the pieces did fly! Then we played the stairs were an alpine peak, and down we slid with shout and with shriek, Roderick, I, and James. But Jim caught his jacket upon a tack, and I burst the buttons all off my back, and Roderick called us names. Then we found a pillow that had a rip, and all the feathers we out did slip, Roderick, James, and I. And we made a snowstorm, a glorious one, all over the room. Oh, wasn't it fun? As the feathery flakes did fly. But just as the storm was raging around, Papa and Mama came in and found Roderick, James, and me. Oh, terrible, terrible things they said, and they put us all three right straight to bed, with the empty pillowcase under our head, and none of us had any tea. End of One Afternoon Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 13 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Z. Martin. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Stove. Betty has a real stove, just as real as the one in the kitchen if it is not quite so big. It has pots and kettles and a frying pan and a soup pot, and the oven bakes beautifully, and it is just lovely. I went to spend the afternoon with her yesterday, and we cooked all the time, except when we were eating. First, we made some soup in the soup pot with some pieces of cold goose, and we took some to Auntie, she is Betty's mother, and she said it was delicious and took two cups of it. They were doll's cups. Betty says I ought to put that in, but I don't see any need. Then we made scrambled eggs and porridge, and baked some custard in the oven, and it was just exactly like a big custard in the big cups at home. The cake was queer, so I won't stop to tell about that, though Rover ate most of it, and the rest we crumbled up for the pigeons, so it wasn't wasted, but the best of all was the griddle cakes. Oh, they were splendid. The griddle is just the right size for one, so they were as round as pennies and about the same size. And we had maple syrup on them. And Maggie the cook said she was so jealous, she called it jellies, that she should go straight back to Ireland. But I don't believe she will. I don't feel very well today, and Betty wasn't at school either. But I don't think it had anything to do with the griddle cakes, and I am going to play with Betty again tomorrow, if Mama will let me. End of the Stove Section 14 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. John's Sister. What? No elder sister? I wouldn't be you. Who buttons your jacket? Who ties up your shoe? Who 
who gives you a boost when you climb a tree who bathes your bumps as kind as can be who guided your oar the first time you paddled who blows your bird's eggs in when they're addled who sets your moths your butterflies too who mops up the floor when you spill the glue who makes you taffy i tell you it's fine who baits your hook untangles your line who takes out your splinters all in a minute who tells you stories and sings like a linnet no sister i pity you truly i do and oh for a whole farm i wouldn't be you end of john's sister section 15 of 5 minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 5 minute stories by laura e richards new year song new year true year what now are you bringing may day skies and butterflies and merry birds are singing frolic play all the day not an hour of school but the merry echo the laughing new year echo only answered school new year true year what now are you bringing summer roses springing gay summer vines are swinging jest and sport the merry sort never a thought of work but the merry echo the laughing new year echo only answered work new year true year what now are you bringing autumn fruits all fire ripe autumn horns are ringing keen delight on moonlight nights when the folks are abed but the merry echo the laughing new year echo only answered bed end of new year song recording by iswa in belgium in august 2015「Section 16 of 5 Minute Stories」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Josh Creek of London, England. Please visit jcreek.co.uk to hear more. 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards What was her name? Wake up, said an old gentleman, dressed in brown and white, as he gently shook the shoulder of a young lady in green, who was lying sound asleep under the trees. Wake up, ma'am. It is your watch now, and time for me to take myself off. The young lady stirred a very little, and opened one of her eyes the least little bit. Who are you? she said drowsily. What is your name? My name is Winter, replied the old man. What is yours? I have not the faintest idea, said the lady, closing her eyes again. Hm, <laughs> growled the old man. A pretty person you are to take my place. Well, good day, Madam Sleepyhead, and good luck to you. And off he stumped over the dead leaves, which crackled and rustled beneath his feet. As soon as he was gone, the young lady in green opened her eyes in good earnest, and looked about her. Madam Sleepyhead, indeed, she re-echoed indignantly. I am sure that is not my name, anyhow. The question is, what is it? She looked about her again, but nothing was to be seen save the bare branches of the trees, and the dead brown leaves and dry moss underfoot. Trees? Do you happen to know what my name is? she asked. The trees shook their heads. No, ma'am, they said. We do not know, but perhaps when the wind comes, he will be able to give you some information. The girl shivered a little, and drew her green mantle about her, and waited. By and by the wind came blustering along. 
He caught the trees by their branches and shook them in rough, though friendly greeting. Well, boys, he shouted, old winter is gone, is he? I wish you joy of his departure. But where is the lady who is coming to take his place? Here she is, answered the trees, sitting on the ground, but she does not know her own name, which seems to trouble her. Ho, ho, roared the wind. Not know her own name? That is news indeed. And here she has been sleeping, while all the world has been looking for her and calling her, and wondering where upon earth she was. Come, young lady, he added, addressing the girl with rough courtesy. I will show you the way to your dressing room, which has been ready and waiting for you for a fortnight and more. So he led the way through the forest, and the girl followed, rubbing her pretty, sleepy eyes, and dragging her mantle behind her. Now it was a very singular thing, that whatever the green mantle touched instantly turned green itself. The brown moss put out little tufts of emerald velvet, fresh shoots came pushing up from the dead, dry grass, and even the shrubs and twigs against which the edges of the garment brushed broke out with tiny swelling buds all ready to open into leaves. By and by the wind paused and pushed aside the branches, which made a close screen before him. Here is your dressing room, young madam, he said with a low bow. Be pleased to enter it, and you will find all things in readiness. But let me entreat you to make your toilet speedily, for all the world is waiting for you. Greatly wondering, the young girl passed through the screen of branches and found herself in a most marvellous place. The ground was carpeted with pine needles, soft and thick and brown. The pine trees made a dense green wall around, and as the winds passed softly through the boughs, the air was sweet with their spicy fragrance. On the ground were piled great heaps of buds, all ready to blossom, violets, anemones, herpaceas, bloodroot, while from under a huge pile of brown leaves peeped the pale pink buds of the mayflower. The young girl in the green mantle looked wonderingly at all these things. How strange! she said. They are all asleep and waiting for someone to waken them. Perhaps if I do it, they will tell me in return what my name is. She shook the buds lightly, and lo, every blossom opened its eyes and raised its head, and said, Welcome, gracious lady, welcome. We have looked for you long, long. The young girl, in delight, took the lovely blossoms, rosy and purple, golden and white, and twined them in her fair locks, and hung them in garlands round her white neck, and still they were opening by the thousands, till the pine tree hollow was filled with them. Presently the girl spied a beautiful carved casket, which had been hidden under a pile of spicy leaves, and from inside of it came a rustling sound, the softest sound that was ever heard. She lifted the lid, and out flew a cloud of butterflies. Rainbow tinted, softly, Glitteringly, gaily fluttering, out they flew by thousands and thousands, and hovered above the maiden's head, and the soft sound of their wings, which mortal ears are too dull to hear, seemed to say, Welcome, welcome. At the same moment a great flock of beautiful birds came, flying, and lighted on the branches all around, and they too sang, Welcome, welcome. The maiden clasped her hands and cried, why are you all so glad to see me? I feel, I know, that you are all mine, and I am yours. But how is it? Who am I? What is my name? And the birds and flowers and rainbow-hued butterflies and sombre pine trees all answered in joyous chorus, Spring! The beautiful, the long-expected! Hail to the maiden, Spring! End of What Was Her Name Thank you for listening. Section 17 of 5-Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. 5-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Lesson Song. Bow down, green forest, so fair and good. 
bow down green forest and give us wood the forest gives us tables the forest gives us chairs the bureau and the sideboard the flooring and the stairs the ships that skim the ocean the cars in which we ride the crib in which the baby sleeps drawn close to mother's side bow down green forest so fair and good bow down green forest and give us wood give up ye mines so dark and deep give up the treasures that close ye keep the mines are dug in the earth so deep tis there that silver and gold do sleep copper and iron and diamonds fine coal tin and rubies all come from the mine give up ye mines so dark and deep give up the treasure that close ye keep o sea with billows so bright so blue full many a gift we ask of you corals yes and sponges clams and oysters too and the radiant pearl drop the oyster hides from view the fish we eat for dinner the shells upon the shore the whalebone for our mother's gown all these and many more o sea with billows so bright so blue full many a gift we ask of you ye broad green meadows so fresh and fair o ye have many treasures rare flowers the loveliest barley and corn oats wheat and clover tops berry and thorn grass for the flocks and herds herbs for the sick rice too and cotton the darkies do pick ye broad green meadows so fresh and fair o ye have many a treasure rare so earth and air so land and sea give kindly gifts to you and me should we not be merry gentle too and mild then the whole wide earth doth wait on each little child should we not in quiet at our mother's knee praise our heavenly father thank him lovingly since earth and air and land and sea give kindly gifts to you and me since earth and air and sea and land come from our heavenly father's hand end of a lesson song section eighteen of five minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org five minute stories by laura e richards the patient cat when the spotted cat first found the nest there was nothing in it for it was only just finished so she said i will wait for she was a patient cat, and the summer was before her. She waited a week, and then she climbed up again to the top of the tree and peeped into the nest. There lay two lovely blue eggs, smooth and shining. The spotted cat said, Eggs may be good, but young birds are better. I will wait. So she waited, and while she was waiting, she caught mice and rats and washed herself and slept and did all that a spotted cat should do to pass the time away when another week had passed she climbed the tree again and peeped into the nest this time there were five eggs but the spotted cat said again eggs may be good but young birds are better i will wait a little longer so she waited a little longer and then went up again to look ah there were five tiny birds with big eyes and long necks, and yellow beaks wide open. Then the spotted cat sat down on the branch and licked her nose and purred, for she was very happy. It is worth while to be patient, she said. But when she looked again at the young birds to see which one she should take first, she saw that they were very thin. Oh, very, very thin they were. The spotted cat had never seen anything so thin in her life now she said to herself if i were to wait only a few days longer they would grow fat thin birds may be good but fat birds are much better i will wait so she waited and she watched the father bird bringing worms all day long to the nest and said aha they must be fattening fast they will soon be as fat as i wish them to be aha what a good thing it is to be patient at last one day she thought, Surely now they must be fat enough. I will not wait another day. Aha! Uh -huh, how good they will be! 
so she climbed up the tree licking her chops all the way and thinking of the fat young birds and when she reached the top and looked into the nest it was empty then the spotted cat sat down on the branch and spoke thus well of all the horrid mean ungrateful creatures i ever saw those birds are the horridest and the meanest and the most ungrateful meow End of the Patient Cat Recorded by Aletha Section 19 of Five-Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Mathematics. I studied my arithmetic and then I went to bed, and on my little pillow white laid down my little head. I hoped for dreams of dear delight, of sugar candy bliss, but oh, my sleep the livelong night was filled with things like this. Add forty jars of damson jam to fifty loaves of cake subtract a cow and tell me how much butter it will make then add the butter to the jam and give it to a boy how long will it take ere grievous ache shall dash his childish joy if twenty men stole thirty sheep and sold them to the pope what would they get if he should let them have the price in soap and if he slew each guileless beast and in pontific glee sold leg and loin for roman coin what would his earnings be next if a tiger climbed a tree to get a coconut and if by hap the feline chap should find the shop was shut and if tin crabs with clawing dabs should pinch his bengal toes what would remain when he should gain the ground do you suppose Divide a stick of licorice by twenty infant jaws. How long must each lose power of speech in masticating paws? And if these things are asked of you while you're a-chewing of it, what sum of birch, rod, pole, or perch will be your smarting profit? I woke upon my little bed in anguish and in pain. I'd sooner lose my brand-new shoes then dream those dreams again oh girls and boys who crave the joys of slumber calm and deep away then kick your arithmetic before you go to sleep end of section nineteen section number twenty of five minute stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards By the Fading Light There was only one chapter more to finish the book. Belle did want very much indeed to finish it and to make sure that the princess got out of the enchanted wood all right and that the golden prince met her, riding on a jet-black charger and leading a snow-white palfrey with a silver saddle for her, as the fairy had promised he would. She did want to finish it, and it seemed very hard that she should be interrupted every minute. First it was dear Mamma calling for a glass of water from her sofa in the next room, and of course Belle sprang with alacrity to answer that call. But then Baby came with a scratched finger to be tied up, and then Willie Boy wanted some more tail for his kite, and he could not find any paper, and his string had got all tangled up. Then came little Carrie, and she had no buttons small enough for her dolly's frock, and did Sister think she had any in her work basket? So Sister looked, and Carrie looked too, and between them they upset the basket, and the spools rolled over the floor and under the chairs as if they were playing a game, and the gray kitten caught her best spool of gold-colored floss, and had a delightful time with it, and got it all mixed up with her claws so that she couldn't help herself, and Belle had to cut off yards and yards of the silk. At last it was settled and the little girl supplied with buttons, and Belle sank back again on the window seat so glad that she hadn't been impatient, and had seen how funny the kitten looked so that she could laugh instead of scold about the silk. 
and when the golden prince saw the princess Merveille, he took her hand and kissed it, for it was like the purest ivory and delicately shaped, and he said, Tinkle, tinkle, went the doorbell, and Belle, with a long sigh, laid down the book and went to the door, for Mary was out. It was old Mr. Grimshaw. "'Good day, miss,' he said with old-fashioned courtesy. "'I have come to borrow the third volume of Paley's Evidences. "'I met your worthy father, and he was good enough to say that you would find the book for me. "'I am of the opinion that he mentioned the right-hand corner of the third shelf in some bookcase. "'I do not rightly remember in which room.' "'Bell showed the old gentleman into the study and brought him a chair "'and looked in the right-hand corners of all the shelves. "'Then she looked in the left-hand corners. "'Then she looked in the middle.' Then she looked on Papa's desk, and in it and under it. Then she looked on the mantelpiece, and in the cupboard, and in the chairs, for there was no knowing where dear Papa would put a book down when his thinking cap was on. All the time Mr. Grimshaw was delivering a lecture on Paley, and telling her on what points he disagreed with him and why, and Belle felt as if a teetotum were going round and round inside her head. At last, in lifting Papa's dressing gown, which hung on the back of a chair, she felt something square and heavy in one of the pockets, and there was the third volume of Paley's Evidences. She handed it to Mr. Grimshaw with her prettiest smile, and he went away thinking she was a very nice, well-mannered little girl. And so she was. But, oh dear, when she got back to the window seat, the daylight was nearly gone. Still, the west was very bright, and perhaps she could just find out. And he said, Princess, my heart is yours. Therefore I pray you accept my hand also, and with it my kingdom of Grindalma, which stretches from sea to sea. Ivory palaces shall be yours, and thrones of gold, mantles of peacock feathers with many chests of precious stones. So the princess... Belle, called Mamma from the next room. It is too late to read, dear. Blind man's holiday, you know, is the most dangerous time for the eyes, so shut the book like a dear daughter. Belle shut the book, of course, but a cloud came over her pleasant face, and two little cross sticks began beating a tattoo on her heart. Just at that moment came voices under the window, Carrie and Willie Boy talking earnestly. Would a princess be very pretty, do you suppose, Willie? Prettier than Belle? Oh, said Willie, who cares for pretty? She wouldn't be half so nice as Belle. Why, none of the other fellows' sisters. They passed out of hearing, and even so the cloud passed away from Belle's brow, and she jumped up and shook her head at herself and ran to give Mamma a kiss and ask if she would like her tea. End of By the Fading Light Recorded by Aletha Section 21 of 5 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Tobogganing Song. When the field lies clear in the moon, boy, and the wood hangs dark on the hill, when the long white way shows never a sleigh, and the sound of the bells is still, then hurry, 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 and bring the toboggans along. Tell mother she need not worry, then off with a shout and a song. A tilt on the billowy slope, boy, like a boat that bends to the sea. With the heart a tilt in your breast, boy, and your chin well down on your knee. Then over, 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 as the boat skims over the main. A plunge and a swoop, a gasp and a whoop, and away o'er the glittering plain. The boat and the bird and the breeze, boy, which the poet is apt to sing, are all 
old and slow and clumsy i know by us that have never a wing still onward 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 till the brook joins the meadow below and then with a shout see a stumbling out to plunge in the soft deep snow back now by the side of the hedge boy where the roses in summer blow oh, where the snow lies deep o'er the winter sleep up up the big hill we go and stumbling 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 hurray tis the top we gain draw breath for a minute before you begin it now over and over again end of toboganning song recording by iswa in belgium in august 2015「Section 22 of Five Minute Stories」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Song of the Tilt Up and down and up we go. I am an eagle and you are a crow. Flap your wings and away we fly. Over the treetop, up to the sky. Up and down and up we go. I am an albatross, white as snow. You are a seagull winging free, out and away to the open sea. Up and down and up we go. I am a wild duck sinking low. You are a wild goose soaring high. The hunter is after us. Fly, oh fly. Tumble and bump and down we go. My leg is broken. Oh, oh, oh. Your nose bleeding? Poor little tot. Well, never mind. Let's play we are shot. End of Song of the Tilt Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 23 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. THE LAZY ROBIN The mother robin woke up in the early morning and roused her three children. Breakfast time, my dears, she said, and a good time for a flying lesson besides. You did well enough yesterday, but today you must do better. You must fly down to the ground, and then I will show you how to get worms for yourselves. You will soon be too old to be fed, and I cannot have you more backward than the other broods. The young robins were rather frightened, for they had only had two short flying lessons, taking little flapping flutters among the branches. The ground seemed a long, long way off. However, two of them scrambled on to the edge of the nest, and after balancing themselves for a moment, launched bravely out, and were soon standing beside their mother on the lawn, trembling but very proud. The third robin was lazy and did not want to fly. 
He thought that if he stayed behind, and said he was sick, his mother would bring some worms up to him, as she had always done before. So he sat still in the nest, and drooped his head. "'Come along!' cried the mother robin. "'Come, Pecky, why are you sitting there alone?' "'I don't feel very well,' said Pecky. "'I don't feel strong enough to fly.' "'Oh!' said his mother. "'Then you had better not eat any breakfast, and I will send for Dr. Woodpecker.' "'Oh, no, please don't!' cried Pecky, and down he fluttered to the lawn. "'That's right!' said the mother robin, approvingly. "'I thought there was not much the matter with you. Now bustle about, my dear. See how well your brother and sister are doing? I declare, Toppy has got a hold of a worm as long as himself. It will get away from him. No, it won't. <laughs> there, he has it now. Ah, that was a good mouthful, Toppy. You will be a fine eater.' Pecky sat still with his head on one side. He felt quite sure that if he waited and did nothing, his mother would take compassion on him, and bring him some worms. There were Toppy and Flappy, working themselves to death in the hot sun. He had always been his mother's favorite. So he thought, but it was not really so. And he was quite sure that she would not let him go hungry. So he gave a little squeak, as if quite tired out, and put his head still more on one side, and shut his eyes, and sat still. Now his mother did not see him at all, for her back was turned, and she was eating a fine caterpillar, having no idea of waiting on lazy birds who were old enough to feed themselves. But someone else did see Master Pecky. Richard Whittington, the great gray cat had come out to get his breakfast too and he saw the lazy robin sitting still in the middle of the lawn with his eyes shut richard could not have caught one of the others they all had their wits about them and their sharp black eyes glanced here and there and they were ready to take flight at a moment's notice but richard whittington crept nearer and nearer to the lazy robin Suddenly, pounce, he went. There was a shrill, horrified squeak, and that was the last of poor Pecky Robin. The mother Robin and her two other children flew up into the tree and grieved bitterly for their lost Pecky, and the mother did not taste a single worm for several hours. But Richard Whittington enjoyed his breakfast exceedingly, and he was as good-natured as possible all day, and did not scratch the baby once. End of The Lazy Robin Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 24 of Five-Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Five-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Boy's Manners. The boy was going out to Roxbury. He was going alone, though he was only five years old. His Aunt Mary had put him in the horse car and the car went directly past his house, and the boy hoped he did know enough to ask somebody big to ask the conductor to stop the car. So there the boy was, all alone and very proud, with his legs sticking straight out, because they were not long enough to hang over. But he did not mind that, because it showed his trousers all the better, and his five cents clutched tight in his little warm hand. Proud as he was, the boy had a slight feeling of uneasiness somewhere down in the bottom of his heart. His Aunt Mary had just been reading Jack and the Beanstalk to him, and he was not quite sure that the man opposite him was not an ogre. He was a very, very large man, about twelve feet tall, the boy thought, 
and at least nine feet round. He had a wide mouth full of sharp-looking teeth, and he rolled his eyes as he read the newspaper. He was not dressed like an ogre, and he carried no knife in sight, but it might be in one of the pockets of his big gray coat. Altogether, the boy did not like the looks of this man at all, but nobody else seemed to mind him. A pretty girl sat down close beside him, a plump, tender-looking young girl, but the big man took no notice of her or anybody else, and kept on reading his newspaper and rolling his eyes. So the boy sat still, only keeping a good lookout, so that if this formidable person should pull out a knife or begin to grind his teeth and roar, fee fi fo fum he could slip off the seat and out at the door before his huge enemy could get upon his feet the car began to fill up rapidly soon every seat was occupied and several men were standing up one of them trod by accident on the ogre's toe the boy could not help calling him the ogre though he felt it might not be right and he gave a kind of growl which made the boy quiver and prepare to jump but his eyes never moved from his newspaper. So the boy sat still. By and by, a poor woman got in with a heavy baby in her arms. She looked very tired, but though there were several other men sitting down beside the big gray one, no one moved to give the woman a seat. The boy remembered his manners and knew that he ought to get up, but then came the thought, if I get up, I shall be close to the ogre, for there's no standing room anywhere else. I am wedged so close between these two ladies that I can hardly get out, and if I do, there cannot possibly be room for that large woman. The boy gave heed to this thought, though he knew in his heart that it did not make any difference. Just then the tired woman gave a sigh and shifted the heavy baby to the other arm. The boy did not wait any longer, but slipped at once down from his seat. Here is a little room, ma'am, he said in his clear, childish voice. There isn't enough room for you, but you might put the baby down and rest your arms. At that moment, the car gave a lurch, and the boy lost his balance and fell forward, right against the knees of the ogre. Hi, hi, said the big man, putting aside his newspaper. What's all this, hey? The boy could not speak for fright, but the poor woman answered, it's the dear little gentleman offering me his seat for the baby, sir. The Lord bless him for a little jewel that he is. Hi, hi, growled the big man, getting heavily up from his seat and still holding the boy's arm, which he had grasped as the child fell. This won't do. One gentleman in the car, eh, and an old fellow reading his newspaper. Here, sit down here, my friend. And he helped the woman to his seat and bowed to her as if she were a duchess. And as for you, hop o' my thumb. Then he stooped and took the boy up and set him on his left arm, which was as big as a table. There, sir, said he, sit you there and be comfortable as you deserve. The boy sat very still. Indeed, he was too frightened to move. Since the man called him hop o' my thumb, he was quite sure that he must be an ogre, perhaps the very ogre from whom Hop and his brothers escaped. The book said he died, but books do not always tell the truth. Papa said so. When the big man began to feel in the right-hand pockets of his gray coat, the child trembled so excessively that he shook the great arm on which he sat. The man looked quickly at him. "'What's the matter, my lad?' he asked, and his voice, though gruff, did not sound unkind. You are not afraid of a big man, are you? Do you think I am an ogre? Yes, said the boy, and he gave one sob and then stopped himself. The gray man burst into a great roar of laughter, which made everyone in the car jump in his seat. Still laughing, he drew his hand from his pocket, and in it was not a knife, but a beautiful shining golden pear. Take that, young hop o' my thumb, he said, putting it in the boy's hands. If you will eat that, I promise not to eat you, not even to take a single bite. Are you satisfied? The boy ventured to raise his eyes to the man's face, 
and there he saw such a kind, funny, laughing look that before he knew it he was laughing too. I don't believe you are an ogre after all, he said. Don't you? said the big man. Well, neither do I, but you may as well eat the pear just the same. And the boy did. End of the Boy's Manners Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 25 of Five-Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson Five-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Merry Christmas, Air as Regnet Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, we sing and we say we usher in joyful the joyfulest day bring cedar and hemlock bring holly and yew to crown father christmas with majesty due chorus to crown father christmas with majesty due merry christmas merry christmas the snow-field lies white the river's a crystal to mirror delight on skates and on snowshoes and sledge and in sleigh we'll meet father christmas and lead him our way Chorus, we'll meet Father Christmas and lead him our way. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, the hearth is piled high, the yellow tongues flicker, the fleet sparkles fly. Bring apples and chestnuts and corn popper here, we'll pledge Father Christmas and make him good cheer. Chorus, we'll pledge Father Christmas and make him good cheer. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, we say and we sing, all honor and life to the winter's glad king. Ring bells in the steeple, shout maidens and men, to greet Father Christmas and greet him again. Chorus, to greet Father Christmas and greet him again. End of A Merry Christmas Section 26 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Ringtum In the land of Ringtum, riddle, riddle, rink, All the happy people whoop will never stop to think. Through the streets they laughing go, Courting to high and low with a nod and a wink, With a jig and a jink. Happy land of Ringtum, rink, I will go there too, I think. In the land of Ringtum, riddle, riddle, rink, every little noisy boysy lemonade may drink. In the street all the road, lemon fountains fall and flow with a splash and a dash, with a gold and silver flash. Happy land of Ringtum, rink, I will go there too, I think. In the land of Ringtum, riddle, riddle, rink, every bud's a rosy posy, every weed's a pink. Candy shops, lollipops, barking dogs, and humming tops. Happy land of Ringtum Rink. I will go there too, I think. End of Ringtum. Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in August 2015. Section 27 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards In the Tunnel Will was digging a tunnel in the long drift. It was the longest drift that Will had ever seen, and he had meant to have Harry help him. But now they had quarreled, and were never going to speak to each other as long as they lived, so Will had to begin alone. He dug and dug, taking up great solid blocks of snow on his shovel and tossing them over his shoulder in a workmanlike manner. As he dug, he kept saying to himself that Harry was the hatefulest boy he ever saw in his life and that he was glad he shouldn't see anything more of him. It would seem queer, to be sure, not to play with him every day, for they had always played together ever since they put on short clothes. But Will didn't care. He wasn't going to be put upon, and Master Harry would find that out. It was a very long drift. Will had never made such a fine tunnel. 
It did seem a pity that there should be no one to play with him in it when it was done. But there was not a soul, for that weaver boy was so rude. He did not want to have anything to do with him, and there was no one else of his age except Harry, and he should never see Harry again, at least not to speak to. Dig, 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 how pleasant it would be if somebody were digging from the other end, so that they could meet in the middle, and then play robbers in a cave, or miners or travelers lost in the snow. That would be the best, because Spot could be the faithful hound, and drag them out by the hair, and have a bottle of milk round his neck for them to drink. Spot was pretty small, but they could wriggle along themselves and make believe he was dragging them. It would be fun. But he didn't suppose he should have any fun now, since Harry had been so hateful, and they were never, no, never going to speak again. If it was ever so, what was that noise? Could it be possible that he was getting to the end of the drift? It was as dark as ever, the soft white darkness of a snowdrift. But he certainly heard a noise close by, as if someone were digging very near him. What if? Willie redoubled his efforts, and the noise grew louder and louder. Presently a dog barked, and Will started, for he knew the sound of the bark. Just then the shovel sank into the snow and threw it, and in the opening appeared Harry's head and the end of Spot's nose. Hello, Will, said Harry. Hello, Harry, said Will. Let's play travelers in the snow, said Harry. This is just the middle of the drift, and we can be jolly and lost. All right, said Will. Let's. They had a glorious play, and took turns in being the traveler and the pious monk of St. Bernard, and they both felt so warm inside, they had no idea that the thermometer was at zero outside. End of In the Tunnel Recorded by Aletha Section 28 of Five Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Practicing Song Re tum tiddy itty re tum tum Here I must sit for an hour and strum. Practicing is good for a good little girl. It makes her nose straight and it makes her hair curl. Re tum tiddy itty re tum ty, bang on the low notes and twiddle on the high, whether it's a jig or the dead march in Saul, I sometimes often feel as if I didn't care at all. Re tum tiddy itty re tum ti, I don't mind the whole or the half note you see, it's the sixteenth and the quarter that confuse my mother's daughter, and the thirty second really is too dreadful to be taught her. Re tum tiddy itty re tum toe. I shall never, never, never learn the minor scale I know. It's gloomier and doomier than puppy dogs a howling. And what's the use of practicing such melancholy yowling? But re tum tiddy itty re tum tum. Still I work away with my drum drum drum. For practicing is good for a good little girl. It makes her nose straight and it makes her hair curl. This last line is not true, little girls, but it is hard, you know, to find good reasons for practicing. End of Practicing Song Recorded by Aletha Section 29 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Queen Elizabeth's Dance. The Spanish ambassador came to see. Queen Bess the Great and Glorious. He was an hidalgo of high degree, and she was a maid victorious. He bowed till he touched her gilded shoe, and he kissed the royal hand of her, and said if she'd marry King Philip the two, he'd take charge of the troublesome land of her. Chorus Oh, she danced, she danced, she danced, and she pranced, she pranced, she pranced. 
oh high and disposedly tips of her toesedly royal elizabeth danced the queen replied with a courtesy low king philip is courtly and kind too but my kingdom is smaller than his you know and rule it myself i've a mind to supreme is the honour of him to be sought oblige him i'm sorry i can't owe but lest you should think you come hither for naught you shall see how i dance a caranto chorus oh she danced she danced she danced etc the spanish ambassador hied him home and told how he had been tried of her and his majesty swore by the pope of rome he'd break the insular pride of her but vain was his hope he never could ope in the land of that marvellous lass adore where she danced in the face of the king and the pope as she danced for the spanish ambassador chorus oh she danced she danced she danced etc end of queen elizabeth's dance recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section number 30 of 5 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Storming Party. It was at Stirling Castle. People who did not know might have called it the Shed, but that would show their ignorance. On the ramparts was mustered a gallant band, the Flower of Scotland armed with mangonels, catapults, and bows and arrows. Below were the English, with their battering rams and culverins and things. Ned was the English general, and led the storming party, and I was his staff, and Billy was the drummer, and drummed for the king. The Scottish general was Tom, and he had on Susie's plaid skirt for a kilt, and his sporan was the rocking horse's tail that had come off. Well, there was lots of snow on the roof, I mean the ramparts, and they hurled it down on our heads, and we played ours with Greek fire, and hit them back like fun, I tell you. There was quite a mountain down below, where Andrew, the chore man, had shoveled off the deep snow, and we stood on this, and it was up to my waist, and I played it was gore, because in Scott they are always wading knee-deep in gore, and I thought I would get ahead of them and go in up to my waist. I hit General Montrose, that was Tom, with a splendid ball of Greek fire, and it was quite soft, and a lot of it got down his neck, and you ought to have seen him dance. He called me a dastardly sassanock, and I thought at first he said sausage, and was as mad as hops, but afterward I didn't care. Then Ned called for volunteers to storm the castle, and we all ran to the ladder, but Ned climbed up the spout, cause he can shin like sixty, and he got up before we did. He took the warder by the throat, just like the bold boucle in Kinmont Willie, and chucked him right off the root ramparts into the gore that made mantros mad as a hornet and he rushed on ned and they got each other round the waist and went all over the roof till at last they got too near the edge and over they both went billy was scared at that and stopped drumming but i drew my mangonel susie says that isn't the right name but i don't believe she knows and rushed on the scottish troops which were only jimmy weaver now that the mantros and the warder were gone I got Jimmy down and put my knee on his chest and shouted, Victory! The day is ours! St. George for England! But then I heard somebody else yelling, and I looked over the ramparts, and there was Montrose with his knee on Ned's chest, waving his culverin and shouting, Victory! The day is ours! St. Andrew for Scotland! I was perfectly sure that our side had beaten, and Tom was absolutely certain that he had won a great victory. But just then Mother called us in to tea, so we could not fight it over again to decide. Anyhow, Montrose got so much Greek fire down his neck that he had to change everything he had on, and I didn't have to change a thing except my stockings. End of A Storming Party Recorded by Aletha Section number 31 of 5-Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards At the Little Boy's Home It was a very hot day, and the little boy was lying on his stomach under the big linden tree reading the Scottish Chiefs. "'Little boy,' said his mother, "'will you please go out in the garden and bring me a head of lettuce?' "'Oh, I can't,' said the little boy. "'I'm too hot.' The little boy's father happened to be close by, weeding the geranium bed, and when he heard this he lifted the little boy gently by his waistband and dipped him in the great tub of water that stood ready for watering the plants. "'There, my son,' said the father, "'now you are cool enough to go and get the lettuce. But remember, next time, that it will be easier to go at once when you are told, as then you will not have to change your clothes.' The little boy went drip, drip, dripping out into the garden and brought the lettuce. Then he went drip, drip, dripping into the house and changed his clothes. But he said never a word, for he knew there was nothing to say. That is the way they do things where the little boy lives. Would you like to live there? Perhaps not. Yet he is a happy little boy, and he is learning the truth of the old saying, Come when you're called, do as you're bid, shut the door after you, and you'll never be chid. End of At the Little Boy's Home Recorded by Aletha Section 32 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Then and Now A Disquisition on the Use of Gunpowder by Master Jack when they first invented gunpowder, they did most dreadful things with it. They blew up popes and parliaments and emperors and kings with it. They put on funny hats and boots and skulked about in cellars, oh. With shaking shoes they laid a fuse and blew it with the bellows, oh. They wore great ruffs, the stupid muffs. At least, that's my opinion. Then, and said, what ho, oh, and sooth tis so and called each other Minion, then. But now the world has turned about five hundred years and more, you see, and folks have learned a thing or two they did not know before, you see. So nowadays the powder serves to give the boys a jolly day and try their Aunt Louisa's nerves and make a general holiday. In open day we blaze away with pop guns and with crackers, oh. With rockets bright we crown the night, and some of them are whackers, oh. And pop, and fizz, and bang, and wheeze, sounds louder still and louder, oh. And that's the way we use today, the funny gunny powder, oh. End of Then and Now, recording by Iswa, in Belgium, in August 2015. Section 33 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura. E. Richards Pleasant Walk Where are you going, Miss Sophia? asked Letty, looking over the gate. I am going to walk, answered Miss Sophia. Would you like to come with me, Letty? Oh, yes, cried Letty. I should like to go very much indeed. Only wait, please, while I get my bonnet. And Letty danced into the house and danced out again with her brown poke bonnet over her sunny hair. "'Here I am, Miss Sophia,' she cried. "'Now, where shall we go?' "'Down the lane,' said Miss Sophia, "'and through the orchard into the fields. "'Perhaps we may find some strawberries.' So away they went, the young lady walking demurely along, while the little girl frolicked and skipped about, now in front, now behind. It was pretty in the green lane, 
the ferns were soft and plumy and the moss firm and springy under their feet the trees bent down and talked to the ferns and told them stories about the birds that were building in their branches and the ferns had stories too about the black velvet mole who lived under their roots and who had a star on the end of his nose but letty and miss sophia did not hear all this they only heard a soft whispering and never thought what it meant presently they came out of the lane and passed through the orchard and then came out into the broad sunny meadow now letty said miss sophia use your bright eyes and see if you can find any strawberries i will sit under a tree and rest a little away danced letty and soon she was peeping and peering under every leaf and grass blade but no gleam of scarlet no pretty clusters of red and white could she see evidently it was not a strawberry meadow she came back to the tree and said there are no strawberries at all miss sophia not even one but i have found something else wouldn't you like to see it something very pretty what is it dear asked miss sophia a flower i should like to see it certainly no it is not a flower said letty it is a cow what cried miss sophia springing to her feet a cow said letty a pretty spotted cow she's coming after me i think miss sophia looked in the direction which letty pointed and there to be sure was a cow moving slowly toward them she gave a shriek of terror then controlling herself she threw her arms around letty be calm my child she said i will save you be calm why what is the matter miss sophia cried letty in alarm miss sophia's face was very pale and she trembled but she seized letty's arm and bade her walk as fast as she could if we should run she said in a quivering voice it would run after us and then we could not possibly escape walk fast my child don't scream try to keep calm why miss sophia cried the astonished child you don't think i'm afraid of that cow do you why it's hush hush whispered miss sophia dragging her along you will only enrage the creature by speaking aloud i will save you dear if i can see we are getting near the fence can't you walk a little faster <coughs> said the cow which was now following them at a quicker pace oh oh cried miss sophia i shall faint i know i shall letty don't faint too dear let one of us escape courage child be calm oh there's the fence run now run for your life the next minute they were both over the fence letty stood panting with eyes and wide mouth open but miss sophia clasped her in her arms and burst into tears safe she sobbed my dear dear child we are safe yes i suppose we are safe said the bewildered letty but what is the matter it was uncle george's cow and she was coming home to be milked <coughs> said uncle george's cow looking over the fence end of pleasant walk recording by greg giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 34 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Great Day. Children, asked Miss Mary the teacher, do you know what day this is? yes ma'am cried bobby wilkins looking up with sparkling eyes does any one else know asked miss mary no one spoke the boy john knew very well what day it was but he was off in the clouds thinking of william the conqueror and did not hear a word miss mary said billy green knew too but he had been reproved for chewing gum in class and was in the sulks and would not speak 
Of course Joe did not know, for he never knew anything of that kind, and none of the girls were going to answer when the boys were reciting. So Bobby Wilkins was the only one who spoke. It is a day, said Miss Mary, looking round rather severely, which ought to waken joy in the heart of every American, young or old. Bobby felt his cheeks glow and his heart swell. He thought Miss Mary was very kind. It is a day, she went on, to be celebrated with feelings of pride and delight. Bobby felt of the bright new half-dollar in his pocket, and thought of the splendid kite at home, and of the cake that mother was making when he came away. He had not wanted to come to school today, but now he was glad he had come. He had no idea that Miss Mary would feel this way about it. He looked round to see how the others took it, but they all looked blank, except the boy John, who was standing on the field of Hastings, and whose countenance was illumined with the joy of victory. It is a day, said Miss Mary, with kindling eyes, for the children were really very trying today, which will be remembered in America as long as freedom and patriotism shall endure. Bobby felt as if he were growing taller. He saw himself in the president's chair, or mounted on a great horse, like the statues of Washington holding out a truncheon. One hundred and eighteen years ago today, cried Miss Mary. Oh, oh my, it ain't, cried Bobby Wilkins, springing up. It's only seven. Bobby, what do you mean? asked Miss Mary, looking at him severely. You are very rude to interrupt me. What do you mean by seven? My birthday, faltered Bobby. I ain't a hundred anything. I'm only seven. Come here, dear, said Miss Mary, holding out her hand very kindly. Come here, my little boy. I wish you very many happy returns, Bobby, dear. But, but I was speaking of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Poor Bobby, Miss Mary shook her head at the children over her shoulder as he sat in her lap as a sign not to laugh, but I suppose they could not help it. They did laugh a good deal, all except the boy John, who was watching Harold die and feeling rather sober in consequence. End of A Great Day Section 35 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Pastoral. The sun was shining calm and bright. The meadow grass was deep. The daisies and the buttercups were nodding fast asleep, and overhead the sparrows sat and crooned upon the bough, and all the world was sleepy then when Johnny drove the cow. The sun was like a flaming beast, the field was like the sea, the grass like angry snakes did hiss and wriggle at his knee. The sparrows turned to goblin imps that yelled and fluttered on as through a world gone raving mad the cow was driving John. End of A Pastoral Section 36 of Five Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Riches. Mama, said Mabel, I am very glad we are rich. Mama looked up with a little smile. She was patching Freddy's trousers, and had just been wondering whether they would last till spring, and if not, how she was to get him another pair. Yes, Mabel, dear, she said. We are very rich in some things. What were you thinking about when you spoke? I was thinking how dreadful it would be to be hungry replied Mabel thoughtfully. I mean, terribly hungry, like people in a shipwreck. Why, just to be a little hungry, 
the way freddy and i get sometimes makes me feel all queer inside and besides it makes me cross and horrid so then i wondered how it would feel to be really hungry and not to be sure that you were going to have good bread and milk for supper and that made me feel so glad that we were rich mamma was silent for a few minutes she was thinking of a house to which she took some work the day before she had passed through the dining room and there at the carved table sat a little girl with her supper before her delicate rolls and cold chicken and raspberry jam and hot cocoa in a china cup all covered with roses and creamy milk in a great silver mug the child was about mabel's age but her face wore a very different expression she had pushed her chair back and was crying out that she would not eat cold chicken she wouldn't she wouldn't she wouldn't so there now the nurse might just as well take it away and she was a horrid cross old thing mamma was going to have partridge for dinner and she wanted some of that and she would have it then when the nurse shook her white-capped head and said no miss your mamma said you were to have the chicken so now eat it like a good girl and you shall have some jam the child flew at her like a little fury and slapped and pinched her that was all that mabel's mamma saw but as she thought of it and then looked at her little maiden with a sweet face smiling over her blue pinafore she smiled again very tenderly and said yes dear it is a very good thing to be rich if it is the right kind of riches go now darling and get the bread and milk set the table and then call freddy in to supper end of riches recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 37 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura e richards poverty it was a lovely day in june and the poor little girl was going out she was so poor that she had to go in a great big carriage with two fat slow horses and a sleepy driver who got very angry if you asked him to drive a little faster she was dressed in a white frock frilled and flounced and she had a fashionable little hat on her head which stuck up in front, so that the wind was always catching it and blowing it off. She had tight kid gloves on her little hands, and beautiful little bronze kid boots on her feet. So you see, she was very poor indeed. The carriage rolled slowly along through the park, and the little girl saw many other poor children, also sitting in carriages, with tight kid gloves and kid boots. She nodded to them, and they to her but it was not very interesting by and by they left the park and drove out into the country where there were green fields with no signs to keep people off the grass the grass was full of buttercups and in one field were two little girls running about with their hands full of the lovely golden blossoms laughing and shouting to each other one had a pink calico dress on and the other a brown gingham, and they were barefooted, and their sun bonnets were lying on the grass. The poor little girl looked at them with sparkling eyes. Oh, mademoiselle, she cried, may I get out and run about a little? See what a good time those children are having. Do let me jump out, please. Fidonc, Claire, said the lady who sat beside her. She was a thin, dark lady with sharp eager black eyes and not a pleasant face fidonc what would madame your mother 
say if she heard you desiring to run in the fields like the beggar children those children dirty little wretches are barefooted and it is evident that their hair has never known the brush do not look at them child look at the prospect i don't care about the prospect said the poor child i want some buttercups we never have buttercups at our house mademoiselle i wish i might pick just a few assuredly not cried mademoiselle her eyes growing blacker and sharper let you leave the carriage and run about in the mire for the sake of a few common vulgar flowers look at your dress claire look at your delicate shoes and your new pearl-coloured gloves are these the things to run in the dirt with i will not be responsible for such conduct sit still and when we reach home the gardener shall pick you some roses i don't want roses said the poor little girl sighing wearily i am tired of roses i want buttercups she sighed again and leaned back on the velvet cushions the carriage rolled on the barefoot children gazed after it with wondering eyes my said one wasn't she dressed fine though yes said the other but she looked as if she was having a horrid time poor thing poor thing echoed the first child end of poverty recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section thirty eight of five minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano five minute stories by laura e richards the best of all i mean to have the best time this fourth of july that i ever had in my life said the big boy then all the other big boys clustered round him to hear what the good time was to be and the little boy sighed and wished he were big too the big boys did not tell him what they were going to do but i know all about it so i can tell they made a camp in the big boy's room which is out in the barn one boy brought a comforter and another brought a pair of blankets and there was an old spring mattress up in the loft so that with the big boy's own bed which could hold two if you kept very still and didn't kick the other fellow out they did very well indeed the big boy's mother knowing something of boys had set out a lunch for them crackers and cheese and gingerbread and milk so there was no danger of starvation of course they were busy in the early part of the evening buying their firecrackers and torpedoes their fish horns and all their noisy horrors for you must understand that this was the night before the glorious fourth but by nine o'clock they were all assembled in the barn ready to have the very best time in the world first they ate some lunch and that was good then they thought they would take a nap just for an hour or so that they may not be sleepy when the time came two of them lay down on the big boy's bed and two on the old spring mattress and two on the floor but it did not make much difference where they began their nap for when the boy's mother took a peep at them about ten o'clock she found them all lying in a heap on the floor sound asleep though the thin boy was groaning in his sleep because the fat boy was lying across his neck suddenly the big boy awoke with a start and looking at his watch found that it was half past eleven hastily he roused the sleepers and there was a hurrying and scurrying a hunting for caps a snatching up of horns and slow match 
Then softly they stole down the barn stairs, and away they went to the old church, and up they climbed into the belfry. The sexton had left the door unlocked, having been a boy himself once, so there they waited till twelve o'clock came. Ah, what a grand time they had then, ringing the bells till they rocked the steeple. But it only lasted an hour, and then there was all the rest of the night. They went here, and they went there, and when they grew hungry, they went back to the barn and finished the lunch. And then they tried to go to sleep again, but they kept falling about so. It was no use. So they waited till they thought their own houses would be open, and then they went home, and the big boy crept into his bed and slept till noon. But the little boy woke up at six o'clock and jumped up like a lark and got his torpedoes and firecrackers, and was very cheerful, though he did sigh just once when he thought of the big boys. He turned the gravel sweep into a battlefield, and made forts and mines for the firecrackers, and then he cracked and snapped and fizzed and blazed, at least the firecrackers did, all the morning. He only burned his fingers twice, and his trousers five times, and that was doing very well. He had a glorious day. And his mother thought, but neither the little boy nor the big boy agreed with her, that the best part of all was the good night's sleep beforehand. End of The Best of All Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 39 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Study Hour. Oh, what a mystery the study is of history! How the kings go ravaging and savaging about. Plantagent or Tudor, I can't tell which was ruder, but Richard III, upon my word, was worst of all the rout. Alfred was a hero, knew no guile nor fear, oh, beat the Danes and checked the Thames, and ruled the country well. Edward I, the hammer, was a slaughterer and slammer, and Bruce alone saved Scotland's throne when neath his blows it fell. Edward III was great, too. Early fought and late, too, drove the French from Cressy's trench like leaves before the blast. But Harry V, the glorious, he the all-victorious, he's the one I'd serve alone, from first unto the last. Oh, what a mystery the study is of history, queens and kings and wars and things, all done in black and white, though sometimes a trifle bloody, tis my best beloved study and only so one learns you know to govern and to fight end of a study hour section number forty of five minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The Young Ladies The young ladies had a reception this afternoon, and a charming occasion it was. The guests were invited for four o'clock, and when I came in at five, the party was in full swing. Claire was the hostess, lovely Claire with her innocent blue eyes and gentle, unchanging smile. The nursery was transformed into a bower of beauty, and Claire was standing by a chair holding out her hand with a gracious gesture of welcome. Alida received with her, and she looked charming too, only she was so much smaller that she had to be stood up on a box to bring her to a level with Claire's shoulder. Alida is a remarkable doll, because she can open and shut her eyes without lying down or getting up, and Betty sat on the floor behind her and pulled the strings, so that she waved her long eyelashes up and down in the most enchanting manner. All the dolls were in their best clothes, except Jack the sailor, who cannot change his suit, because it is against his principles. 
and I must say they made a pretty party. The tea things were set out on the little round table, all the best cups and saucers, and the pewter teapot that came from Holland, and the gold spoons, and there was real cocoa, and jam, and oyster crackers, and thin bread and butter. Rosalie Urania presided at the tea table and poured the cocoa with such grace that no one would have suspected her of being helped a little by Juliet, Juliet is not a doll, who was hidden behind the table. "'Will you have a cup of cocoa?' asked Rosalie sweetly as Mr. Punchinello approached her with his most elegant bow. "'With pleasure, lovely maiden,' was the courtly reply. "'From your hands what would not your devoted Punchinello take?' He bowed and smiled again. Indeed, he was always smiling, while Rosalie, blushing, it was a way she had, lifted the pewter teapot and deftly filled one of the pretty cups. "'He'll take a looking from my hands if he doesn't look out,' growled Jack the sailor, who is jealous of Punchinello and loves Rosalie Urania. "'Hush, you rude creature!' whispered Alida, giving Jack a little push. Claire is quite sure that Alida only meant the push as a gentle rebuke to Jack and a warning to keep quiet and not let his angry passions rise. But Claire always stands up for Alida. However, it was. Jack tottered, staggered forward, and fell against Mr. Punchinello, knocking that smiling gentleman over on the table and upsetting the teapot all over Rosalie Urania's pink silk gown. Such a confusion as arose then. Rosalie fainted, of course. Jack picked himself up and looked black as thunder. Alida shut her eyes and kept them shut. She said it was from horror, but it may have been because Betty forgot to pull the opening string. But Claire and Mr. Punchinello did nothing but smiled, which was a proof of their exquisite breeding. End of the Young Ladies Recorded by Aletha Section 41 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories. By Laura E. Richards. The Weathercock. The Weathercock stands on the steeple, and there the Weathercock stands. He flaps his wings, and he claps his wings, because he has no hands. He turns him round when the wind blows, he turns again and again. But Baby has hands, and can clap them flip them and flop them and flap them swing them and ring them and slap them far better than cock or hen end of the weather cock recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section 42 of 5 minute stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Ichthyology. I, John Dory, tell the story of the night when the pinna gave a dinner to the trout. It was surely, yet not purely, a delight, though attended, I and ended, with a rout. Every fish, un of a condition, sure was there, from the cuddle down to the little Tommy Spratt, from the urchin who was perching on the stair, to the tunny in his funny beaver hat. The swordfish, like the lordfish that he is, brought the pilot, saying, My lot shall be yours. The guffer tried to huffer with a quiz, but the gurnet looked so stern and made him pause. The grayling was a-sailing through the dance, and the oyster from her cloister had come out, and the minnow with her fin, oh, did advance, and the flounder capered round her with the pout. When the winkle with a twinkle in his eye led the codfish, such an odd fish, to the feast, 
cried the mullet oh my gullet is so dry i could swallow half the hollow sea at least the frogfish and the dogfish followed next and the sturgeon was emergin from his lair and the herring by his bearing was perplexed but the tinker as a thinker did not care the cobbler such a gobbler as he was why the blenny had not anything to eat and the trunkfish grew a drunkfish just because the place there said the dace there was so sweet the torpedo said to feed oh is my joy let me wallow let me swallow at my will cried the shark then here's a lark then come my boy give a rouse now we'll carouse now to our fill the dolphin was engulfing lager beer though the porgy said how logy he will be and the scallop gave a wallop as they handled him a collop and the sculpin was a gulpin of his tea deary me how that sculpin was a gulpin of his tea i john dory to my glory be it said took no part in such cavortin as above with the sunfish ah the one fish calm i fed and grown bolder softly told her of my love but the conger cried no longer shall this be and the trout said no doubt now it must end said the tench from his bench then count on me and the salmon cried i am on hand my friend then we cut on to each glutton as he swam and we hit them and we bit them in the tail and the lamprey stuck the damp prey with a calm and the goby made the foe be very pale the gudgeon be not begrudgeon of his force hit the cunner quite a stunner on the head and the mussel had a tussle with the horse and the whiting kept a fighting till he bled the carp too bold and sharp too joined our band on the weaver gay deceiver did he spring and the mackerel laid the pickerel on the sand and the stickleback did tickle back the ling we drove them and we clove them to the gill we raced them and we chased them through the sea and the scallop gave a wallop and then we took away his callop but the sculpin still was gulpin of his tea deary me how the sculpin was a gulpin of his tea end of ichthyology section forty three of five minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by z martin five minute stories by laura e richards a happy morning this is the recipe for a happy morning two small children boys or girls be sure that they are good ones two wooden pails two shovels of wood or metal one sea one sandy beach with not too many pebbles one dozen clam shells more or less one sun two sunbonnets or broad-brimmed hats one mother or nurse within calling distance starfish and sea urchins to taste mix the shovels with the sandy beach and season well with starfish add the sunbonnets to the children and when thoroughly united add the wooden pails spread the sun and the sea on the beach and sprinkle thoroughly with sea urchins and clam shells add the children mix thoroughly and bake as long as advisable n b do not add the mother at all except in case of necessity end of a happy morning section forty four of five minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano five minute stories by laura e richards lilies and cattails mother said roger swinging in at the door and catching up the baby for a toss 
I am going to begin physical geography, and teacher says I must have a book, please, as soon as I can get it. It costs two dollars, and it's just full of pictures. Oh, so interesting. And may I get it today, please, mother? Mother looked up with a sad little loving smile. Dear heart, she said, I have not two dollars in the world just now, unless I take them from the money I'm saving for your new suit. And I hardly ought to do that, my poor Roger. Roger looked down with a rueful whistle at his clothes, which, though clean, were patched and darned to the utmost limit. I'm afraid the patent mosaic suit is rather past the bloom of youth, he said cheerily. Never mind, Mammy. Perhaps Will Almy will lend me his book, sometimes, or I can study in recess out of Miss Black's. Don't worry, anyhow, but catch Miss Dumpling here while I go and bring in some water. Mrs. Rain sighed deeply as Roger set the baby on her lap and darted out of the house. She knew it was to hide his face of disappointment that the boy had gone off so hurriedly. Poor Roger, so bright, so eager to learn. He ought to have a first-rate education. But how could she, a widow with four children on a tiny farm, give it to him? Bread and butter and decent clothing must come first. And these were hard enough to win. Even though she worked all day and half the night for them, education must be picked up as it could. The little woman shook her head and sighed again, as she put Miss Dumpling on the floor with a button string to play with, and took up the pile of mending. But Roger, though he was disappointed, had no idea of giving up the physical geography. Not a bit of it. Mother cannot get it for me, he said, as he turned away at the windlass of the old well. Very well, then. I must get it myself. The only question is, how? Up came the brimming bucket, and, as he stooped to lift it, he saw in the clear water the reflection of a bright, anxious face, with inquiring eyes and a resolute mouth. Don't be afraid, old fellow, he said with a reassuring nod. How is a short question, and I'm sure to find the answer before the day is out. And, whistling merrily, he went off to water the garden. That evening, just as the sun was sinking, all golden and glorious beneath the horizon, a boat pushed out from among the reeds that fringed Pleasant Pond. It was a rough little dory of no particular model, painted a dingy green, but its crew was apparently well satisfied with it. One boy sat in the stern and paddled sturdily. Another crouched in the bow, scanning the reeds with a critical air, while between them sat a little fair-haired maiden, leaning over the side and singing, as she dipped her hands in the clear, dark water. "'Here's a fine bunch of cattails,' cried Roger. "'Shove her in here, Joe.' Joe obeyed, and Roger's knife was soon at work cutting the stately reeds, with their scepter tips of firm brown velvet. "'Oh, and here are the lilies,' cried little Annet. "'See, Roger, see, all white and gold, the lovely things. Oh, let me pull them.' In another moment, the boat seemed to be resting on a living carpet of snow and gold. The lilies grew so thick that one could hardly see the water between them. Roger and Annette drew them in by handfuls, laying them in glistening piles in the bottom of the boat, and soon Joe laid down his paddle and joined in the picking. "'Some pooty, mayn't they?' he said. "'What ye call it later sell em for, Roger?' "'For whatever I can get,' replied Roger cheerfully. I've never tried it before, but I know that plenty of boys do take them to the city from other ponds and streams. We are a little further off, but I never saw any lilies so large as ours. Nor so sweet, cried Annet, burying her rosy face in the golden heart of a snowy cup. Oh, how I love them! How the lilies must have wondered at the adventures that befell them after this. All night they lay in a great tub of water which was well enough, though there was no mud in it. Then, at daybreak next morning, they were taken out and laid on a bed of wet moss, and covered with wet burdock leaves. Then came a long period of jolting, when the world went bumping up and down, with a noise of creaking and rumbling, broken by the sound of human voices. 
Finally, and suddenly, they emerged into the full glare of the sun, and found themselves in a new world altogether, a street corner in a great city, tall buildings, glittering windows, crowds of men and women hurrying to and fro like ants about an ant hill, only the cool wet moss beneath them, and the sight of their old friends, the cattails, standing like sentinels beside them, kept the lilies from fainting away altogether. Roger looked eagerly about him, scanning the faces of the passers-by. Would this one buy, or that one, that pretty lady, who looked like a lily herself? He held out a bunch timidly, and the lady smiled and stopped. How lovely and fresh! Thank you! And the first piece of silver dropped into Roger's pocket, and clinked merrily against his jackknife. Then another young lady carried off a huge bunch of cattails, and a second piece of silver jingled against the first. Soon another followed it, and another, and another, and Roger's eyes danced, and his hopes rose higher and higher. At this rate, the physical geography would be his, beyond a doubt. He saw it already, the smooth green covers, the delightful maps within, the pictures of tropical countries, of monkeys and coconuts, elephants, and thump! His dream was rudely broken in upon by a gentleman running against him and nearly knocking him over. An old gentleman with fierce, twinkling eyes and a bushy gray beard. What? What? sputtered the old gentleman pettishly. Get out of my way, boy. My fault. Beg your pardon. Roger moved aside, bewildered by the sudden shock. Will you buy some physical geography, sir? he asked. See how fresh they are? They are the loveliest. The boy is a lunatic, said the old gentleman fiercely, and ought to be shut up. How dare you talk to me about physical geography, sir? Roger stared at him blankly, and then grew crimson with shame and confusion. I, 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 I beg your pardon, sir, he faltered. I meant to say lilies. I was thinking so hard about the geography that it slipped out without my knowing it. I suppose I... I what? What? cried the old gentleman, catching him by his arm. Thinking about physical geography, eh? What do you mean? This is a remarkable boy. Come here, sir. Come here. He dragged Roger to one side, and made him sit down beside him on a convenient doorstep. What do you mean? he repeated, fixing his piercing gray eyes upon the boy in a manner which made him feel very uncomfortable. What do you know about physical geography? Uh, nothing yet, sir, replied Roger modestly, but I'm very anxious to study it and I'm selling these lilies and cattails to try and get money enough to buy the book. This is a most remarkable boy, cried the old gentleman. What geography is it that you want, hey? Merton's, I'll warrant. Trash, sir, unspeakable trash. No, sir, Wilson's, replied the boy, thinking that the old gentleman was certainly crazy. But on hearing this, his strange companion seized him by the hand and shook it warmly. I am Willison, he exclaimed. It is my geography. You are a singularly intelligent boy. I am glad to meet you. Roger stared in blank wonderment. Did, did you write the physical geography, sir? He stammered finally. To be sure I did, said the old gentleman. And a good job it was. While well, that ass Merton here, here, he cried, fumbling in his pockets. Give me the lilies and take that and he thrust a shining silver dollar into Roger's hand. And here, he scribbled something on a card, take that, and go to Cooper, the publisher, and see what he says to you. You are an astonishing boy. Goodbye. God bless you. You've done me good. I was suffering from dyspepsia when I met you. Atrocious tortures. All gone now. Bless you. He was gone, and Roger Rain was sitting alone on the steps, with the dollar in one hand, and the card in the other, as bewildered a boy as any in Boston town. When he recovered his senses a little, he looked at the card and read in breezy, straggling letters, Give to the astonishing boy who brings us a copy of my physical geography. Best binding. William Willison. End of Lilies and Cattails Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 45 of 5-Minute Stories, 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Metals. In the earth dark bosom, long I slumbered deep, till the hardy miners woke me from my sleep. Now I flash and glitter, now I'm bought and sold. Every one for me doth run, for my name is gold. In jewels and money I shine, I shine. The great world of riches is mine, is mine. Yet he who would live for my sake alone is poorer, more wretched than he who has none. I, your sister, silver, pure and fair and white, I was made like you to give pleasure and delight. Mines in Colorado and in far Peru Yield my shining whiteness up to be a mate for you. The forks and spoons and the baby's cup, the plates that are set where the queen doth sup, the coffee and teapots, the cream pitcher too, the money to buy them all show my hue. I am Father Ryan, I am not a beauty, but when called upon you'll find I will do my duty. Melted in the furnace I am wrought and cast, making now a tiny tack, now an engine vast. The horseshoes, the boilers, the stoves, the sinks, the cable that holds the good ship with its links, the tongs and the poker, the wire so fine, the pickaxe, the shovel, are mine, are mine. Hail my father, Ryan, I your son am still, heating and then cooling, mended me a kneel, with the silver's brightness, with the strength of iron, here I stand a metal all men may rely on. I flash in the sword, in the dagger keen, in rails and in engines my glint is seen, the scissors, the needle, the knife and the pen, and many more things I have given to men. So ever and ever, hand in hand, we circle the earth with a fourfold band. The servants of men, so real and true, by day and by night, his work we do. End of the Metals Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in August 2015「Section 46 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Hollery Growlery Room. It doesn't pay to be cross. It's not worth while to try it, for Mammy's eyes so sharp are very sure to spy it. A pinch on Billy's arm, a snarl or a sullen gloom. No longer we stay, but must up and away to the howlery growlery room. Chorus: Hi the howlery, ho the growlery, hi the sniffery, snarly scowlery. There we may stay if we choose all day, but it's only a smile that can bring us away. If Mammy catches me a pitching into Billy, if Billy breaks my whip or scares my rabbit silly, it's make it up, boys, quick, or else you know your doom. We must kiss and be friends, or the squabble ends in the howlery growlery room. Chorus: Hi the howlery, ho the growlery. Ha, the sniffery, snarlery, scowlery. 
there we must stay if we choose all day but it's only a smile that can bring us away so it doesn't pay to be bad there's nothing to be won in it and when you come to think there's really not much fun in it so come the sun is out the lilacs are all abloom come out and play and we'll keep away from the howlery growlery room coarse hi the howlery ho the growlery ha the sniffery snollery scowlery there we must stay if we choose all day but it's only a smile that can bring us away End of the Howlery Growlery Room Section 47 of 5-Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. 5-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards the speckled hen there was once a hen with brown speckled wings and a short black tail she stood in a shop window on a bit of wood covered with green baize and kept watch over the eggs with which the window was filled i may be stuffed said the hen but i hope i know my duty for all that there were many eggs and some of them were very different from the eggs to which she had been accustomed but she did not see what she could do about that their mothers must be people of very vulgar tastes she said or else fashions have changed sadly in my day a hen who laid red or blue or green eggs would have been chased out of the barnyard but the world has gone steadily backward since then i have reason to think she was silent and fixed her eyes on a large white egg which had been recently placed in the window there was something strange about that egg she had never seen one like it no hen that ever lived could lay such a monstrous thing even a turkey could not produce one of half the size whence could it have come she remembered stories that she had heard when a pullet of huge birds as tall as the hen house called ostriches could this be an ostrich egg if it was she could not possibly be expected to take care of the chick the idea she said why it will be as big as i am at this moment a hand appeared in the window it was the shopkeeper's hand and it set down before the hen an object which filled her with amazement and consternation it looked like an egg that is it was shaped and colored like an egg but from the top which was broken protruded a head which certainly was not that of a chicken the head wore a black hat it had a round rosy face something like the shopkeeper's and what could be seen of the shoulders was clad in a bottle-green coat with a bright red cravat tied under the pink chin. The little black eyes met the hen's troubled glance with a bright and cheerful look. "'Good morning,' said the creature. "'It's a fine day.' "'What are you?' asked the hen rather sternly. "'I don't approve of your appearance at all. "'Do you call yourself a chicken, pray?' "'Why, no,' said the thing, looking down at itself i i am a man i think eh i have a hat you see no you are not cried the hen in some excitement men don't come out of eggs you ought to be a chicken but there is some mistake somewhere can't you get back into your shell and change your clothes or do something i am afraid not said the little man for he was a man i don't seem to be able to move much and besides, I don't think I was meant for a chicken. I don't feel like a chicken. Oh, but look at your shell, cried the poor hen. Consider the example you are setting to all these eggs. There's no knowing what they will hatch into if they see this sort of thing going on. I will lend you some feathers, she added coaxingly, and perhaps I can scratch round and find you a worm, though my legs are pretty stiff. Come, be a good chicken and get back into your shell i don't like worms said the little man decidedly and i am not a chicken i tell you did you ever see a chicken with a hat on N no replied the hen doubtfully i don't think i ever did well then said the little man triumphantly and the hen was silent 
for one cannot argue well when one is stuffed. The little man now looked about him in a leisurely way, and presently his eyes fell on the great white egg. Is that your egg? he asked politely. The hen appreciated the compliment, but replied rather sadly, No, it is not. I do not even know whose egg it is. I expect to watch over the eggs in a general way, and I hope I know my duty, but I really do not feel as if I could manage a chicken of that size. Besides, she added with a glance at the black hat and the bottle green coat, how do I know that it will be a chicken? It may hatch out a, a sea serpent, for aught I know. Would you like to make sure? asked the little man, who really had a kind heart and would have been a chicken if he could. There seems to be a crack where this ribbon is tied on. Shall I peep through and see what is inside? I shall be truly grateful if you will, cried the hen. I assure you it weighs upon my mind. The little man leaned over against the great white egg and took a long look through the crack. Compose yourself, he said at last, looking at the hen with an anxious expression. I fear this will be a blow to you. There are five white rabbits inside this egg. The speckled hen rolled her glass eyes wildly about and tried to cackle, but in vain. This is too much, she said. This is more than I can bear. Tell the shopkeeper that he must get someone else to mind his eggs, for a barnyard where the eggs hatch into rabbits is no place for me. And with one despairing cluck, the hen fell off the bit of wood and lay at full length on the shelf. It is a pity for people to be sensitive, said the little man to himself as he surveyed her lifeless body. Why are not five rabbits as good as one chicken, I should like to know. After all, it is only a man who can understand these matters. And he cocked his black hat and settled his red necktie and thought very well of himself. End of the Speckled Hen Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 48 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards the money shop jack russell was five years old and ten days over therefore it is plain that he was now a big boy he had left off kilts and his trousers had as many buttons as it is possible for trousers to have and his boots had a noble squeak in them what would you have more this being the case of course jack could go downtown with his mamma when she went shopping a thing that little boys cannot do as a rule one day in christmas week when all the shops were full of pretty things jack and his mamma found themselves in the gay street with crowds of people hurrying to and fro all carrying parcels of every imaginable shape the air was crisp and tingling the sleigh bells made a merry din and everybody looked cheerful and smiling as if they knew that Christmas was only five days off. Almost everybody, for as Jack stopped to look in at a shop window, he saw someone who did not look cheerful. It was a poor woman, thinly and miserably clad, and holding a little boy by the hand. The boy was little, because he wore petticoats. Oh, such poor, ragged petticoats. But he was taller than Jack. He was looking longingly at the toys in the window. Oh, mother, he cried, see that little horse. Oh, I wish I had a little horse. My dear, said the poor woman, sighing, if I can give you an apple to eat with your bread on Christmas Day, you must be thankful, for I can do no more. Poor people can't have pretty things like those. Come, Jack, said Mrs. Russell drawing him on hastily. What are you stopping for, child? Mama, asked Jack, 
trudging along stoutly, but looking grave and perplexed. Why can't poor people have nice things? Why? Oh, said Mrs. Russell, who had not noticed the poor woman and her boy, because they have no money to buy them. Pretty things cost money, you know. Jack thought this over a little in his own way. Then, but mamma, he said, why don't they buy some money at the money shop? Mrs. Russell only laughed at this, and patted Jack's head, and called him a little goose. And then they went into a large shop, and bought a beautiful wax doll for Sissy. But Jack's mind was still at work, and while they were waiting for the flaxen-haired beauty to be wrapped in white tissue paper, and put in a box, he pursued his inquiries. Where do you get your money, Mama dear? Why, your dear Papa gives me my money, Jackie boy. Didn't you see him give me all those nice crisp bills this morning? And where does Papa get his money? Oh, child, how you do ask questions. He gets it at the bank. Then is the bank the money shop, Mama? Mrs. Russell laughed absent-mindedly, for, in truth, her thoughts were on other things, and she was only half listening to the child, which was a pity. Yes, dear, she said, it is the only money shop I know of. Now you must not ask me any more questions, Jack. You distract me. But Jack had no more questions to ask. The next day, as the cashier at the National Bank was busily adding up an endless column of figures, he was startled by hearing a voice which apparently came from nowhere. No face appeared at the little window in the gilded grating, and yet a sweet, silvery voice was certainly saying, with great distinctness, If you please, I should like to buy some money. He looked through the window and saw a small boy, carrying a bundle almost as big as himself. What can I do for you, my little man? asked the cashier kindly. I should like to buy some money, please, repeated Jack very politely. Oh, indeed, said the cashier, with a twinkle in his eye. And how much money would you like, sir? About a thousand dollars, I think, said Jack promptly. It does sometimes happen that big boys cannot pronounce th distinctly, but they are none the less big for that. A thousand dollars, repeated the cashier. That's a good deal of money, young gentleman. I know it, said Jack. I wants a good deal. I have brought some things to pay for it, he added confidentially. And opening the big bundle, with great pride, he displayed to the astonished official a hobby horse, a drum, nearly new, a set of building blocks, and a paint box. It's a very good hobby horse, he said proudly. It has real hair, and he will go just as fast as, as you can make him go. Here the cashier turned red in the face, coughed, and disappeared. Perhaps he is having a fit, like the yellow kitten, said Jack to himself calmly, and he waited with cheerful patience till he should get his money. In a few moments the cashier returned, and taking him by the hand, led him kindly into a back room, where three gentlemen were sitting. They all had gray hair, and two of them were gold-bowed spectacles. But they looked kind, and one of them beckoned Jack to come to him. What is all this, my little lad? he asked. Did anyone send you here to get money? Jack shook his head stoutly. No, he said. I come to myself, but I am not little. I stopped being little when I had trousers. I see, said the gentleman. Of course. But what made you think you could get money here? The blue eyes opened wide. Mama said that Papa got his money here, and I asked her if this was a money shop, and she said it was the only money shop she knowed of, so I cummed. Just so, said the kind gentleman, stroking the curly head before him. And you brought these things to pay for the money. Yes, said Jack cheerfully, cause you buy things with money, you see. So I suppose you buy money with things. And what did you mean to do with a thousand dollars? asked the gentleman. Buy candy, eh? Then Jack looked up into the gentle gray eyes, and told his little story about the poor woman 
whom he had seen the day before. She was so poor, he said. Her little boy could not have any Christmas at all, only an apple and some bread, and I'm sure that isn't Christmas. And she hadn't any money, not any at all, so I thought I would buy her some, and then she could get everything she wanted. By this time, the two other gentlemen had their hands in their pockets, but the first one motioned them to wait, and taking the little boy on his knee, told him in a few simple words what a bank really was and why one could not buy money there but you see dear he added seeing the disappointment in the child's face you have here in your hands the very things that poor woman would like to buy for her little boy give her the fine hobby horse and the drum and the paint box too if you like and she can give him the finest christmas that ever a poor boy had Jack's face lighted up again, and a smile flashed through the tears that stood in his sweet blue eyes. "'I never thought of that!' he cried joyfully. "'And,' continued the old gentleman, drawing a gold piece from his pocket, and putting it in the little chubby hand, "'you may give that to the poor woman to buy a turkey with.' "'And that!' cried the second old gentleman, putting another gold piece on top of it to buy mince pies with and that cried the third old gentleman while a third gold piece clinked on the other two to buy a plum pudding with and god bless you my dear little boy said the first gentleman and may you always keep your loving heart and never want a piece of money to make christmas for the poor little jack looked from one to the other with radiant eyes you are very good shopkeepers he said i love you all very much I should like to kiss you all, please. And none of those three old gentlemen had ever had so sweet a kiss in his life. End of The Money Shop Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 49 of Five Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Long Afternoon what shall i do all this long afternoon cried will yawning and stretching himself what shall i do a whole long afternoon and the rain pouring and nothing to do it will seem like a whole week till supper time i know it will oh dear me it is too bad said aunt harriet sympathetically poor lad what will you do indeed while you are waiting suppose you just hold this yarn for me will held six skeins of yarn one after another and aunt harriet told him six stories one after the other each better than the last he was sorry when the yarn was all wound and he began to wonder again what he should do all the long long afternoon will said his mother calling him over the balusters I wish you would stay with baby just a few minutes while I run down to the kitchen to see about something. Will ran up, and his mother ran down. She was gone an hour, but he did not think it was more than ten minutes, for he and baby were having a great time, playing that the big woolly ball was a tiger, and that they were elephants chasing it through the jungle. Will blew a horn, because it spoke in the Swiss Family Robinson of the elephant's trumpeting and baby blew a tin whistle which was a rattle too and the tiger blew nothing at all because tigers do not trumpet it was a glorious game but when mamma came back will's face fell and he stopped trumpeting because he knew it would tire mamma's head dear mamma he said what shall i do this long long afternoon with the rain pouring and nothing to do 
His mother took him by the shoulders, gave him a shake and then a kiss, and turned him round toward the window. Look there, Goosey, she cried laughing. It stopped raining half an hour ago, and now the sun is setting bright and clear. It is nearly six o'clock, and you have just precisely time enough to run and post this letter before tea time. End of A Long Afternoon Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 50 of 5 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Jacket. Taylor, Taylor, tell me true. Where did you get my jacket of blue? I bought the cloth, little master mine, from the merchant who sells it coarse and fine. I cut it out with my shears so bright, and with needle and thread I sewed it tight. Merchant, merchant, tell me true, where did you get the cloth so blue? The cloth was made, little master mine, of woolen thread so soft and fine. The weaver wove them together for me. With loom and shuttle his trade plies he. Weaver, weaver, speak me sooth, where got you the threads so soft and smooth? From wool they are spun, little master mine. The spinner carded the wool so fine. She spun it in threads and brought it to me, where my sounding loom whirs cheerily. Spinner, spinner, tell me true, where got you the wool such things to do? From the old sheep's back, little master dear. The farmer he cut it and washed it clear. The dyer dyed it so bright and blue and brought it to me to spin for you. Now, tailor and merchant, and weaver too, and spinner and farmer, my thanks to you. But the best of my thanks I still will keep for you, my good old woolly back cheap. End of the Jacket Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in November 2015「LibriVox Recordings」are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Fireworks. Once upon a time, a little girl went to see the fireworks on Boston Common. She was a very small girl, but she wanted to go just as much as if she had been big, so her mother said she might go with Mary, the nurse. She put on her best bonnet and her pink frock, and off they went. The common was crowded with people, and in one part there was a dense throng, all standing together, and all looking in one direction. We must stand there too, said Mary. That's where the fireworks are going to be. So they went and stood in the dense crowd, and the little girl saw the back of a fat woman in a red plate shawl, but she could not see anything else. Oh, yes. She saw the legs of the tall man who stood next to the fat woman, but they were not very interesting, being clad in a common sort of dark plaid. The shawl, at least, was bright, and she could tell the different colors by the lamplight. Now there was a movement in the crowd, and people cried, Oh, oh, look at that! Isn't that a beauty? And they clapped their hands and shouted, but the little girl saw only the plaid shawl and the uninteresting legs of the tall man. The people pressed closer and closer so that she could hardly breathe. She held tight to Mary's hand, and Mary thought she was squeezing it for pleasure, and said, Yes, dear, ain't they lovely? The little girl tried to say, I can't see anything but the plaid shawl. But just then the tall man turned round and looked down on her and said, Bless me, here's a little girl right under my feet. Can you see anything, my dear? Nothing but the red shawl and the back of your legs said the little girl sadly. Hi, then, said the tall man. Up with you. And before the child could say a word, he had taken her two hands and lifted her lightly to his shoulder. Put your arm round my neck, said the tall man. I had a little girl once, just like you, and I know how to hold you. So, now you are all right. Thank the kind gentleman, dear, said Mary. I'm sure it's very good of him. The little girl was too shy to speak, 
but she patted the tall man's neck, and he understood as well as if she had spoken. Now she saw wonderful sights indeed. Fiery serpents went up into the sky, wriggling and hissing, dragging long tails of yellow flame behind them. Colored stars, red, blue, and green, shot up in the air, hung for an instant, and then burst into showers of rainbow light. There were golden pigeons and golden flower pots and splendid wheels that went whirling round so fast it made the little girl dizzy to look at them. The child gazed and gazed, breathless with delight. Sometimes she forgot where she was and thought this was fairyland, all full of golden dragons and fluttering elves as the story books described it. But if she chanced to look down, there was Mary and the kind face of the tall man and the red shawl of the fat woman. By and by came a great burst of light, and in the midst of crimson flames she saw the goddess of liberty, standing on a golden ball, waving the starry flag in her hand. Thousands of stars shot up, blazed and burst, loud noises were heard like cannon shots. Then suddenly darkness fell, and all was over. The crowd began to disperse. Now, little one, said the tall man, you have seen all there is to see, and he made a motion to put her down but the little girl clung tight to his neck. Did your little girl ever kiss you? She whispered in his ear. Bless your little heart, said the man. She did indeed, but it's long since I've had a little girl to kiss me. The child bent down and kissed him heartily on the cheek. If it hadn't been for you, she cried, I should have seen nothing at all except the plaid shawl. I think you are the kindest man that ever lived, and I love you very much. And then she slipped down, and taking her nurse's hand, ran away home as fast as she could. End of the fireworks. Section 52 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Kansas. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards jingle the sugar dog lay in the toe of the stocking and rocking as if in a cradle he called to the drum to come but the ball and the gray flannel pig were too cunning and running with noah's ark filled the stocking quite up to the top the jumping jack could not get into the stocking how shocking he had to climb up on the foot of the bed instead but the rag doll was wise, and while baby was sleeping, came creeping, and nestling under the sweet baby arm lay warm. End of Jingle Section 53 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Z. Martin. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Seesaw. Punky Doodle was at one end of the seesaw, and Jollapin at the other. Those are not the boys' real names, but they will do just as well, and they look better on paper than Joe and, oh, well, no matter. It was a very high seesaw, and they meant to have a fine time on it. I am an eagle, cried Jollapin, as his end went up, up, till his breath was almost gone, and he had to hold on with all his might to keep from slipping. I am an eagle, I say. Ho, see me fly up among the clouds. I am sailing. Oh, I say, don't shake her like that, punk, or you'll have me off. "'Well, you've been up long enough,' cried Punky Doodle. "'It's my turn now. "'Look at me! I am a flying dragon. "'Observe my fiery eyes and my long wiggling tail. "'Hoish! I am going to descend on the fields and dwellings of man "'and lay them waste, and I'll never stop "'until they give me the king's daughter for my bride. "'I may eat her up, but I'm not sure. "'Depends on how pretty she is. Hoish! I descend upon thee. Here he descended with such swiftness that speech became impossible, and Jollapin soared aloft again. I am a balloon this time, he cried. 
"'You look like one,' said Punky Doodle, who had not relished his sudden descent on the fields and dwellings of men. "'I am not an old skinny, anyhow,' retorted Jollapin. "'I am a splendid balloon, and my name is the Air King. Proudly I ascend, rising triumphant through the ambient air.' Jollapin had been reading the papers, and his speech was inflated like the balloon he represented. "'I pass through the clouds. I pierce them. I rise above them. The earth lies beneath me like a... like a... like a pancake,' suggested Punky Doodle, who had little imagination. "'I wish you wouldn't interrupt me, Punk. But what do I see? Yes, I know it's your turn now, but just a minute. What do I see? Another majestic airship.' "'sailing gloriously towards me. "'That's you, Punky. "'Now we'll seesaw together, tiddledies up and down, "'and play the balloons are meeting. "'Ha! We meet. We salute in mid-air. "'I wave my gilded banner. "'Here one balloon lost his balance and tumbled off, "'and the other tumbled on top of him, "'and there they both lay in a heap on the lawn. "'Anybody killed?' asked the elder brother, "'looking up from his hoeing. "'I guess not.' said Punky Doodle, rising slowly and feeling himself all over. Jollapin is all right, cause he has plenty of fat to fall on, but I got a pretty good thump, I can tell you. Too bad, said the elder brother. You need a change, dear boys. Suppose you go and weed the pansy bed to take your minds off your injuries. End of Seesaw Section 54 of Five Minute Stories by Laura Richards. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Nancy's Nightmare. I am the doll that Nancy broke, hadn't been hers a week. Punch me behind, and I sweetly spoke. Rosy and fair was my cheek. Now my head is rolled in a corner far, my body lies here in another, and if this is what human children are, I never will live with another. I am the book that Nancy read for twenty minutes together. Now I am standing here on my head while she's gone to look at the weather. My leaves are crushed in the cruelest way. There's jam on my opening page. And I would not live with Miss Nancy Gay, though I should not be read for an age. I am the frock that Nancy wore last night at her birthday feast. I am the frock that Nancy tore in seventeen places at least. My buttons are scattering far and near, my trimming is torn to rags, and if I were Miss Nancy's mother dear, I'd dress her in calico bags. We are the words that Nancy said when these things were called to her view. All of us ought to be painted red, and some of us are not true. We splutter and mutter and snarl and snap, we smolder and smoke and blaze, and if she'd not meet with some sad mishap, Miss Nancy must mend her ways. End of Nancy's Nightmare Section 55 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Section 55. Amy's Valentine. John, said little Amy, did you ever send a valentine to anybody? John the gardener looked rather sheepish and dug his spade into the geranium bed. Well, miss, he said, I have done such things when I were a lad. Most lads do, I suppose, miss. Oh, that sly old John. He knew perfectly well that he had a valentine in his pocket at that moment. A great crimson heart in a lace-trimmed envelope directed to Susan, the pretty housemaid. But there was no need of saying anything about that to little miss, he thought. 
if you were not so very old john continued amy looking seriously at him i should ask you to send me one because my papa is away and i have no brothers and i don't know any lads as you call them but i suppose you are altogether too old aren't you john john straightened his broad shoulders and looked down rather comically at the tiny mite at his feet why miss amy he said whatever does make you think i should be so very old your papa is a good bit older than i be miss my papa cried amy opening her eyes very wide why john you told me yourself that you were a hundred years old and i know my papa isn't nearly so old as that the gardener laughed more shame to me miss he said for telling you what wasn't true sure it's only in fun i was miss amy dear for i'm not forty years old yet let alone a hundred but i hear mary calling you to your dinner so run up to the house now missy and don't think too much of what old john says to you away ran little amy and john left alone with his geraniums indulged in a quiet but hearty laugh to think of that he said to himself a hundred years old sure i must take care what i say to that young one but the pretty lass shall have her valentine and she shall and as pretty a one as i can make and john dug his spade into the ground with right goodwill it occurs to me that you children who live in the north may say here what was he doing to the geranium bed in february but when i tell you that little amy lives in virginia you will not think it so strange st valentine's day was bright and sunny and amy was up early flying about the house like a bird and running every five minutes to the front door cause there might be a valentine mamma presently she spied the postman coming up the gravel walk and out she danced to meet him oh such a pile of letters as she took out of his leather bag miss amy russell said the postman oh cried amy she's me i mean me's her i mean oh oh one two three four five oh thank you mr postman you're the best postman in the whole world and in she danced again to show her treasures to mamma gold lace silver arrows flaming hearts oh how beautiful they were but suddenly ting tingle ding a tremendous peal at the front doorbell down went the valentines in mamma's lap and off flew the excited child again but this time when she opened the door no sound escaped her lips her feelings were too deep for utterance there on the doorstep lay a valentine but such a valentine a large flat basket entirely filled with white carnations with a border of scarlet geraniums and in the middle of a large heart of deep red carnations with the words my valentine written under it in violets amy sat down on the doorstep with clasped hands and wide open eyes and mouth she rocked herself backwards and forwards uttering little inarticulate shrieks of delight and john the gardener peeping round the corner of the house chuckled silently and squeezed the hand of susan the pretty housemaid who happened curiously enough to be standing very near him humph said john the gardener i haven't forgotten how to make valentines if i be a hundred years old end of amy's valentine section fifty six of five minute stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia five minute stories by laura e richards once upon a time once upon a time there was a little girl just like you who couldn't count two and she had a dreadful time about it she did not know she had two feet so she sometimes forgot to put on both her shoes she did not know she had two eyes so she would sometimes go to sleep with one eye and stay awake with the other she did not know she had two ears so she would sometimes hear half of what mamma said and not the other one day mamma called to her and said pet i want you to take this syrup and put it in my closet 
Now Pet was only listening with one ear, and so she only heard the first half of what Mamma said. I want you to take the syrup. That was what she heard. She liked the syrup very much, for she had ten drops in a teaspoon whenever she had a sore throat, and she had always wished Mamma would give her more. And now she was just to take it. That must mean to take the whole bottle, if she liked. She put the bottle to her lips and took a good long draught. It was more than half empty when she stopped to take breath. And then the syrup did not seem to taste good any longer. She put the bottle down. Oh, dear me, in about ten minutes, Pet was the very sickest little girl you ever saw in your life. Mamma put her to bed and sent for the doctor, and she had to take four different kinds of medicine before she got well, not one of which tasted good at all. So now, you see, it is a very good plan for little wee girls to learn to count too. End of Once Upon a Time Section 57 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Judy Derby Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The Pathetic Ballad of Clarinthia Jane Louisa To be sung to the tune of the monkey married the baboon's sister. This is Clarinthia Jane Louisa, holding her brother Ebenezer. Here he sits on the post to please her, happy little too. Dog came by with a growl and a grumble, made Clarinthia start and stumble. Poor Ebenezer got a tumble, boo hoo 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 hoo. End of The Pathetic Ballad of Clarinthia Jane Louisa Section 58 Of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ruhi Hack Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards A Day in the Country We are spending the day in the pleasantest way with Uncle Eliphalet Brown. We may run at our ease and do just what we please, and we never can do that in town. For quack says the duck, and the hen says cluck, and the chickens say peepity wee, and John milks the cow, though he doesn't know how. And we are happy, as happy can be. End of A Day in the Country Section 59 of 5 Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Goosey Lucy It chanced one day that Lucy came into the kitchen just as Fido, her Aunt Mary's little dog, was eating his dinner. He had a good dinner, and he was making a great fuss over it, growling with pleasure, shaking his ears, and wagging his tail. His tail was a very funny one, with a little black bunch at the end of it, and it wiggled and waggled this way and that way. Fido, said Lucy, I don't think you ought to wag your tail when you're eating. Mamma says we must sit very still at the table. To be sure, you are not sitting and you are not at the table, but all the same, I think you had better not wag your tail. Fido paid no attention to these sensible remarks, but continued briskly to wag the offending tail. Do you hear me, Fido? said Lucy. I say don't wag it. Fido gave a short bark of protest, but took no further notice. Then I must hold it for you, Lucy continued severely. Mamma held my hands once when I could not stop cutting holes in my pinafore. But I was young then, and I thought the spots ought to be taken out. But you're not young, Fido, and I wonder at you, that I do. 
Then Lucy took hold of his tail and tried to hold it. But Fido danced about and pulled it away and then wagged it all the harder, thinking she meant to play with him. Indeed, said Lucy, I am not playing, Master Fido. Now you shall see. She got a piece of stout twine and tied Fido's tail to the leg of a chair. There, she said, now finish your dinner like a good little dog, and I don't give me any more trouble. But Fido would not eat his dinner with his tail tied up. He threw back his head and gave a piteous little howl. Lucy sat down on a stool beside him and folding her hands, as she had seen her mother do, prepared to give the naughty pet a good talking to, as nurse used to say. At that moment, however, her mother's voice was heard calling, Lucy, Lucy, where are you? Here, Mama, cried Lucy. I'm coming. I meant to pick them up before dinner, anyhow. Yes, I did. And she flew upstairs, for she knew quite well that she had set out all her doll's dishes, tea set and dinner set, and kitchen things on the nursery floor, and left them there. And now nurse had come in with baby in her arms, and had walked right over the pretty French dinner set, and there was very little of it left to tell the tale. Dear, dear, it was not at all nice to pick up the pieces, even if nurse had not been scolding all the time, and mamma standing by with that grave look, waiting to see that it was properly done. But how about Fido? Oh, Lucy had quite forgotten about Fido, but Fido had not forgotten himself, and a very hard time the poor little fellow was having. He ran round the chair several times, till I brought himself up close against it. Then he tried to unwind himself again, but only became more and more entangled. He pushed the hateful chair backwards till it struck a little table, on which was a tray full of dishes. Over went the table, down went the tray, and crash went the dishes. Yo, yo, yo! howled Fido. Oh, oh, oh! shrieked Bridget, the cook, who came in at that moment, and then whack, whack, whack went the broomstick over the poor doggie's back. The noise was so great that Mama came flying down, and Nurse and Lucy, too, with the broken soup tureen in her hand. Oh, don't beat him, cried Lucy. Don't beat him, Bridget. It was my fault, for I tied him to the chair and then forgot about him. And why, for pity's sake, miss, did ye tie the beast to the chair? said Bridget, still angry. Look at every dish I have in the kitchen, all broken and smithereens. He would wag his tail while he ate his dinner, faltered Lucy, and I wanted to teach him better manners, and so, and so. But here poor Goosey Lucy broke down completely, and sat down among the shattered dishes, and hugged Fido and wept over him. And Fido, who had the sweetest temper in the world, wagged the poor abused tail, which had been quickly released by Nurse, and forgave her at once. And Bridget and Nurse laughed, and Mamma kissed her little foolish daughter and bade her not to cry any more. But Lucy had to go to bed all the same, for Mamma said it was the only proper place for a child who had broken or caused to be broken, which amounted to the same thing, seventy-two dishes, large and small, in less than half an hour. And I suppose Mamma was right, don't you? End of Goosey Lucy Recording by Katrina Section 60 of 5-Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Goosey Lucy's New Year's Calls Where are you going, Uncle Fred? asked Lucy. I am going to make New Year's Calls, little girl, replied Uncle Fred. And how do you make them? What are they made of? inquired Lucy. Oh, ah, uh, my dear child, said Uncle Fred, who was looking for his umbrella in a great hurry. They are, they're made of nothing. You, uh, you just call, you know, on all the people you know. Oh, here it is. Goodbye, little girl. I must be off. 
and off he hurried leaving lucy mystified in the hall you just call she repeated just call all the people you know why that is easy enough but what a funny thing to do she pondered a few minutes and then continued i think i will go and make new year's calls it must be great fun perhaps i shall meet uncle fred and then we can call together and that will be just twice as loud away ran the little girl to her room blue coat blue leggings blue mitted swans down hood all were on in three minutes time and without a thought of mamma or nurse or anybody else lucy slipped out of the door and ran merrily down the street oh how fresh and clear the air was how the snow sparkled in the sunlight what a fine thing it was to make new year's calls and now the question was where should she call first why at grandma's of course her house was in the square just around the corner and then she would go to aunt maria's and then well she would think about the next place as she went along but here was grandmamma's house right now lucy looked up at all the windows but no one was in sight so much the better she planted herself squarely in the curbstone and opening her mouth to its fullest extent shouted grandmamma 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 her grandmother who was sitting quietly by the fire reading heard the piercing screams and running to the window as fast as her dear old feet could carry her saw lucy panting and crimson with her mouth just opening for another shout something had happened at home an accident probably no time to be lost grandmamma threw up the sash run and call the doctor she cried quick dear don't stop to tell me about it but run i will be there in three minutes and she shut the window and trembling with anxiety hastened to put on her shawl and bonnet and almost ran through the snow to her daughter's house meanwhile lucy ran on in high glee i hadn't thought of the doctor she said but of course i will go there as grandmamma wishes it what fun it is the doctor's house was soon reached and lucy's shouts brought the good man quickly to the door bless me he said mrs graham's little girl baby ill again i suppose all right my dear he cried to lucy i'll be there instantly run and tell them i'm coming and he shut the door and called for his boots lucy danced along enchanted with her new play and soon reached aunt maria's house where she called again with might and main now aunt maria was slightly deaf and when she heard her own name resounding in a clear shrill scream aunt maria she thought it was a cry of fire throwing up the window she was a very nervous and excitable person she shrieked fire fire police watchman help help fire fire till every one within a dozen blocks heard her and came rushing to the rescue with buckets and fire extinguishers lucy was rather frightened at all this and thought on the whole she would not make any more calls that day so she went home and there were grandmamma and the doctor and mamma all waiting for her with very grave faces the two first had arrived breathless and agitated inquiring what had happened and who was ill much perplexity followed and now that the author of all the mischief had arrived what should be done to her lucy's finger went into her mouth and her head went down but she told her story truthfully and was such a funny one that the doctor burst into a roar of laughter and grandmamma laughed heartily and even mamma could not look grave so goosey lucy had a lecture and a new year's cookie and went to tell her dolls all about it while mamma and grandmamma and the doctor went to see how aunt maria was End of Goosey Lucy's New Year's Calls Recording by Katrina Yankovichuta Section 61 of 5 Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards Three Little Birds Three little birds sat upon a tree. The third said, Cheer up. The second said, Chee. 
the third said nothing the middle one was he but sat there a blinking because he was a thinking peewit peewit yes that is it peewip peewop peewee three little birds sat upon a bough the third said when is dinner time the second said now the third said nothing the middle one was he but sat there a blinking because he was a thinking peewit peewit yes that is it peewip peewop peewee three little birds flew down to the ground and soon by working very hard the fine fat worm they found the third flew down between them the middle one was he and did it up like winking because he had been thinking peewit peewit yes that is it peewip peewop peewee End of Three Little Birds, recording by Iswa, in Belgium, in November 2015. Section 62 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Z. Martin. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The Quacky Duck The Quacky Duck stood on the bank of the stream, and the frogs came and sat on stones and insulted him. Now the words which the frogs used were these, Yaha, he hasn't any hind legs. Yaha, he hasn't any four legs. Oh, what horrid luck to be a quacky duck. These were not pleasant words. And when the quacky duck heard them, he considered within himself whether it would not be best for him to eat the frogs. Two good things would come of it, he said. I should have a savory meal, and their remarks would no longer be audible. So he fell upon the frogs, and they fled before him. And one jumped into the water, and one jumped on the land, and another jumped into the reeds, for such is their manner. But one of them, being in fear, saw not clearly the way he should go and jumped even upon the back of the quacky duck. Now this displeased the quacky duck, and he said, If you will remove yourself from my person, we will speak further of this. So the frog, being also willing, strove to remove himself, and the result was that they too, being on the edge of the bank, fell into the water. Then the frog departed swiftly, saying, Solitude is best for meditation. But the quacky duck, having hit his head against a stone, sank to the bottom of the pond, where he found himself in the frog's kitchen. And there he spied a fish, which the frogs had caught for their dinner, intending to share it in a brotherly manner, for it was a savory fish. When the quacky duck saw it, he was glad, and he said, Fish is better than frog, for he was an English duck. And taking the fish, he swam with speed to the shore. Now the frogs lamented when they saw him go. For they said, He has our savory fish, and they wept and reviled the quacky duck. But he said, Be comforted, for if I had not found the fish, I would assuredly have eaten you. Therefore, say now, which is the better for you? And he ate the fish and departed joyfully. End of The Quacky Duck Section 63 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. New Year Thoughts. When the New Year's come, when the New Year's come, then I will be a soldier, a beating on a drum, a beating on a drum, and a tooting on a fife, and the New Year, the New Year, oh, that's the best in life. When the New Year comes, when the New Year comes, I shan't have any geography, I shan't have any sums, I shan't have any sums, nor any rule of three, and the New Year, the New Year, oh, 
that's the time for me p s when the new year came when the new year came i had to go to school just exactly the same exactly the same do you think twas kind of mother and the new year the new year is just like any other end of new year thoughts Section 64 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Nonsense. Marjorie Maggot, she lighted a faggot to cook a repast for her cat. But instead of a bone, she made soup of a stone, and gave the poor animal that. Barney O'Grogan, he bought a toboggan, and went out to coast on the hill. But he soon tumbled off, and came home with a cough, and his grandmother gave him a pill. Triptolemus Tupper came home to his supper, and called for a pelican pie. But twas covered with fat, and when he saw that, poor Trippy was ready to die. Peter Palacco was fond of tobacco and purchased a pipe for to smoke but against his desire his whiskers caught fire and peter was made into coke prudence pedantic she nearly went frantic because her small nephew said taint but when her big brother said hate got none other she fell on the floor in a faint end of nonsense section sixty five of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards the singular chicken Hal woke up very early on Christmas morning so early that it was still quite dark he crept out of bed and ran to the chimney got his stocking which had been hung there the night before and carried it back to bed with him oh what a delightful fat lumpy stocking it was why did not the daylight come so that he might see what was in it this was an orange on top he could tell that without seeing it and this long soft thing which jingled as he pulled it out oh a pair of reins how nice but what was this that came next ah little hal must wait till daylight for that for his tiny fingers refused to tell him what it was wait he did very impatiently consoling himself with his orange but at last a little gray light came stealing in at the window and two little bare feet went trotting across the floor and two little hands held up a mysterious object to the light it was a chicken a most beautiful yellow chicken with bright black eyes and a little sharp beak and oh what was this why why the chicken's head came off and the chicken's body was all full of sugar plums oh 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 cried little hal mammy mammy come and look at this chicken he can spit his head out end of the singular chicken recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 66 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Clever Parson. My children, come tell me now if you have ever 
Heard of the parson who was so clever; So clever, so clever, so clever was he, That never a cleverer parson could be. The parson loved children, he also loved walking, And off to the woods he was constantly stalking, To hear the sweet birds and to see the green trees, And to do just exactly whatever you might please. The children they followed him once to the wood, They loved the good parson because he was good, They followed him on for many a mile, to list to his voice and to look at his smile. At length the children cried, Oh dear me, we're tired, as tired, as tired can be. Tis supper time too, while afar we does roam. Now please, dear parson, to carry us home. The children were six and the parson was one. Now, goodness gracious, what was to be done? He sat himself down in the shade of a tree and pondered the matter most thoughtfully. At length he exclaimed, my dear little chicks, I might carry one, but I can't carry six. Yet courage, your parson's good care will provide that each of you home on his own horse shall ride. He drew out his jackknife, so broad and so bright, and fell to work, slashing with main and with might, till ready there, one, two, three, four, five, and six, lay smooth and well polished, some excellent sticks. Now mount your good horses, my children, he cried. Now mount your good horses and merrily ride, a pace and a trot and a gallop away, and we shall be there ere the close of the day. The children forgot they were dreadfully tired. They seized on the hobbies with ardor inspired. Gee, Dobbing, woe, Dobbing, come up, Dobbing, do. Oh, Parson, dear Parson, won't you gallop too? Away went the children in frolicsome glee, away went the Parson, as pleased as could be. And when they arrived at the village, they cried, Oh dear and oh dear, what a very short ride. End of The Clever Parson Section 67 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Kathleen Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The Purple Fish Should I tell you what happened to Elsie one day? She was sitting on the beach in her green cart, which had lost both wheels, so that it was not of much use as a cart, though very nice to sit in. And presently a purple fish with a yellow tail came and looked at her, and he said, Little maiden, fair to see, Will you take a trip with me? Elsie smiled and answered, Yes, I will, without a doubt, if you will not tip me out. Then the purple fish took the string of the cart in his mouth and swam away. The cart bobbed up and down on the waves and behaved quite like a boat, and Elsie clapped her hands and laughed and sang. The fish swam on and on, till at length he came to a little island, all covered with purple hyacinths and yellow violets, here he stopped and bade Elsie get out, saying, Now, if you will marry me, here we'll live and be happy. But Elsie did not like this at all, though the island was very beautiful. She shook her head resolutely and replied, If you please, I do not wish for to marry any fish. Then the purple fish was angry, and his yellow tail quivered with vexation. He said sternly, If you will not be my wife, you shall stay here all your life. And off he swam, taking the green cart with him. Poor Elsie was very unhappy, for she could not bear to think of spending her whole life on the island. And yet she did not want to marry a fish, even if her mamma were willing, which she was quite sure she would not be. But as she was sitting there, making a wreath of the yellow violets, two seagulls came flying by. They stopped when they saw Elsie, and one of them said, here upon this purple island what do i see but a human chisland there isn't any such word as chislin said elsie it is child don't you know i am not very familiar with english replied the seagull the other word rhymes better but i am not prejudiced what are you doing here child nothing replied elsie if you please did you ever marry a fish both the seagulls showed strong signs of disgust at this, and said, 
we eat fish but never marry them why do you ask because the purple fish with the yellow tail said i must stay here all my life unless i would marry him and he has taken away my green cart so that i cannot get home as to that said the seagulls we can easily manage to get you home put your arms around our necks and hold on tight so the seagulls flew away with elsie and brought her safely home she kissed them and thanked them what can i give you dear seagulls she asked in return for your saving me from that horrid fish could you give us your golden curls asked the seagulls we think they would become us and they are a thing not often seen in our society no elsie could not do that but she said i can give you each a necklace of glass beads fastened with a rosette of peach-coloured ribbon i made them yesterday for my dolls but you are welcome to them just the thing said the seagulls so elsie put the necklaces round their necks and they thanked her and flew away i have been told that they flew straight to the island and spent the whole afternoon in making rude remarks to the purple fish with the yellow tail but one need not believe all one hears end of the purple fish Section 68 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Mr. Somebody. My little one came to me weeping, weeping. Over her cheeks, the bright tears creeping. Oh, Mammy, tis raining and pouring away. We cannot go to the picnic today. I took the darling up in my lap and tried to make light of the great mishap. Be patient, child, with the rain, for, oh, it makes Mr. Somebody's garden grow. Garden grow, garden grow. It makes Mr. Somebody's garden grow. My little one came to me sighing, sighing almost ready again for crying oh mammy the sun is so blazing hot the flowers i planted are dead on the spot i took the darling up on my knee and kissed and spoke to her cheerily be glad my child of the sun to-day it helps mr somebody make his hay make his hay make his hay it helps mr somebody make his hay my little one came to me panting, panting, hair a flutter and bonnet a wanting. Oh, Mammy, the wind came roaring at me and blew my bonnet right up in a tree. I took the darling up on my arm, and soon the poor bonnet was out of harm. Be glad, my child, of the wind, for you know it makes Mr. Somebody's windmill go. Windmill go, windmill go, it makes Mr. Somebody's windmill go. There's many a thing that seems just too bad to this little lass or that little lad. But, dears, that which hardest to you may be may fill Mr. Somebody's heart with glee. Heart with glee, heart with glee, may fill Mr. Somebody's heart with glee. End of Mr. Somebody. Section 69 of five minute stories this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by kathleen five minute stories by laura e richards a christmas ride the sleigh had just driven from the door with a great jingling and shouting and the little boy was left at home with his foot up on the sofa for he had a sprained ankle. I wish I could have gone, said the little boy. You shall go, said Sister Sunshine. We will go together, you and I. She brought a great book with bright pictures in it and sat down by the little boy's side. First, we must choose our carriage, she said. There was a whole page of carriage pictures, all very splendid, and after some thought they chose a gilded shell with the front turning over into a swan's neck an empress of russia had driven in this the book said and so they thought it was good enough for them 
the horses were coal black and there were six of them four more than papa and the other children had sister sunshine tucked the little boy well up and it appeared that the robes were all of ermine and sable whereas he had been thinking that they were only a striped afghan one does not always know things till one is told here we go cried sister sunshine how the horses dash along it takes my breath away we are going to st petersburg to see the ice palace on the neva the empress has sent her own private sleigh to take the little boy and i can go too because i belong to him she turned the page and there sure enough was the ice palace the sun shone splendidly on it and it looked as if the fairies had built it there is the empress waiting for us said sister sunshine i suppose it would be polite to go in wouldn't it the little boy thought it would decidedly so they took the empress's hand and went in through one grand room after another the empress gave them each a lovely little porcelain stove to carry under their arm for the ice halls were cold i am used to it she said and do not mind it she showed them all her jewels which shone and sparkled like living flames and then she brought them long sticks of candy striped red and white and cream walnuts and barley sugar lions just the things the little boy liked best and they both said how funny it was that she should know all about it when the people at home so often forgot and gave him whorehound which he could not abide and then said it was good for his cold after that they drove a long way over the ice and the little boy thought he would like to go to egypt and see if they knew their lessons about moses there because he sometimes forgot his and there was egypt just a few pages off with lots of pyramids and the sphinx and all the right egypty things they got on camels and went to find some children and there to be sure were plenty of them all looking just exactly like the pictures in the bible but not a single one of them knew anything about moses which made the little boy feel more puffed up than he had any reason to be they left the carriage and got into a nile boat because they wanted to go over the cataracts and sister sunshine thought the horses might not like it but before they got to the very first one the little boy was sound asleep and he never woke up till the others came home from their sleigh ride he was quite sure that they could not possibly have had so good a time as he had and anyhow nobody had given them so much as a single bite of candy they said that themselves end of a christmas ride Section 70 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Funny Fellow. A great many queer things happen in this world, and this morning I saw one of them. We have a little aquarium, just a long glass box with some stones arranged in it to form a pretty little rock work and plenty of bladderwort for the fish to feed on. We have a good many fish, three sticklebacks and a lot of dace, the pretty silver dace, and some minnows and a crayfish. But the pride of the aquarium is the newt. Did you ever see a newt? He is a little creature like a lizard about two inches long, in color light brown with black spots. He is quite tame and not in the least afraid of us. Well, yesterday morning I was watching the fish and seeing that the greedy ones did not get more than their share of breakfast, when Master Newt came up out of the water and seated himself on top of the rock work, which projects an inch or two above the surface. He sat quite still for a few minutes, and I made no motion, thinking he had come to take a look at the upper world, and would prefer to be left to himself. 
Presently, he began to move his little paws about. They are just like tiny hands with long, thin fingers, and to rub himself and wriggle about in a very queer way. I had watched him for some minutes before I realized what he was doing, but suddenly it flashed upon me that he was going to change his skin. I knew that newts often changed their skin, but I never expected to see one do it. Presently it was loose enough, and my little friend began to draw it off, slowly, beginning with the paws. The skin came off in perfect shape, and in a moment there was a pair of fairy gloves floating in the water, the prettiest things that ever were seen. Next, Master Newt began to unbutton his waistcoat, so to speak, and then to take off coat, waistcoat, breeches, and all. He did look very fine in his new coat, which shone with lovely colors and was as soft and smooth as gossamer. I thought I should like to have a new dress every day if I could manage it with no more trouble than this. But what was he going to do with his old clothes? There were no closets in the aquarium, no clothes bags, no obliging old clothes fish who would take it off his hands and give him a trifle for it. What would he do with the old suit? I was soon to see. Master Newt sat still for a few minutes after his great feet, seeming to enjoy the change, waving his delicate crest with evident satisfaction. Then he took up the old suit of skin which lay on the rock beside him. And then, who can guess what he did next? Mind, I saw this with my own two eyes the very ones that are looking down on this paper as I write. Why, he rolled it up carefully, made a ball of it, and then ate it up. End of A Funny Fellow Section 71 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Wofsky Pofsky. Wofsky Pofsky, Wofsky Pofsky, once he was a Cossack hatman, but he fell into the Dnieper and became a Cossack wetman. End of Wofsky Pofsky. Section 72 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. April and the Children. Bring your basket, Molly Miller. Tie your kerchief, Susan Gray. Come while still the dewdrops twinkle, o'er the hill with us away. Every field is sunning, sunning, broad its breast in morning's blue. Every brook is running, running, shall not we be running too? April calls from hill and valley, clad in fairy gold and green. Bring your posies, Kate and Sally, gather round our maiden queen. Hark, the woods are ringing, ringing, thrushes trill and wood doves coo. All the birds are singing, singing, shall not we be singing too? Columbine, the airy lady, nods a greeting, light and free. Where the leaves are cool and shady, violets spring for you and me. Clover top, his red is showing, daisies peep in white and gold. Tulips in the garden glowing flaunt their scarlet, brave and bold. Look, the orchard's all in flower, and the white and rosy bloom turns it to a royal bower, fairy April's tiring room. Peach and apple, plum and cherry, all the air with fragrance woo. Since the world is making merry, shall not we be merry too? Leave your book now, Peter Ponder, leave your lambkin, Betty Brown, Jack and Willie, Maud and Millie, 
tie the cap and kilt the gown when the sunbeams gay and glancing throw their golden smiles to you when the leaves are dancing dancing shall not we be dancing too ring around a rosy posy hands across and back again drop your curtsy jess and josie swing your partner mary jane trip and skip and down the middle till the echo cries halloo since tis april plays the fiddle i will come and dance with you end of april and the children Section 73 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Snowball. It was the perfect snowball day. There had been a heavy snowstorm, and then the sky had cleared, and the weather turned soft and warm. What could be more delightful? Rita was too little to go to school, but she was not too little to make snowballs. So Mammy put on the little girl's coat and hood and leggings and overshoes and mittens and turned her out of doors in the sunshine. Oh, how bright it was! How the world sparkled and twinkled and laughed! Rita laughed, too, and at first could only jump up and down for pure joy and sing, Ho, 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 pretty white snow! the song of her own composition, of which she was justly proud. But presently she said to herself, Snowballs! And from that moment she had no time for singing or jumping. She made some dumplings and set them in a row on the piazza to bake in the sun. Then she saw three little birds in the tree and threw the dumplings at them in case they might be hungry. Then she made a pudding and stirred it with a large icicle which made the best possible pudding stick. Then she made some eggs and pelted River with them till that dog fairly yelled with excitement. At last she said, I know what I will do. I'll make a great snowball like the gray sausage in my German picture book. So the little girl set to work and rolled and patted and pressed till she had a well-shaped ball to begin with. Then she laid it on the smooth snow table cloth of the lawn and began to roll it in good earnest, here and there, over and over and over. The snow was in perfect condition, soft and moist. Every particle clung to the ball, which grew bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. At last Rita's arms were tired, and she stopped to rest and to look about her. She was at the end of the lawn, where the bank sloped up to the stone wall how nice it would be if she could roll the great snowball up the bank and push it to the top of the wall then papa would see it when he came home to dinner and he would be so astonished he would just say who upon hearth put that great huge snowball there and rita would say i did pappy decisely my own pickety self and then papa would say why what a great big girl my rita is i must take her to town to-morrow day and buy her a muff and a doll with wink eyes and a squeaky doll and a prayer book and an album and a big boots and a gold watch and a stick of striped candy and then by this time rita was quite ready to go to work again the snowball was very big by this time quite as big as she was and the bank though not high was very steep but Rita's short arms were sturdy, and her courage knew no measure. So at it she went, pushing the great ball up, inch by inch, puffing, panting, her cheeks growing redder and redder, but with no thought of giving up. Now by this time the snowball began to have its own ideas. Just at what point of bigness a snowball begins to have a mind of its own, I cannot tell you, so you must ask someone wiser than I. But this snowball had reached the point. At this time it was saying to itself, What fun this child is having! But I do not enjoy it at all. This pushing, that is the fun, apparently. Why should I not push the child? I am bigger than she. It would be m very pleasant to roll down the bank and push her before me. I might try. I think I will. There! Down went the snowball. Down went little Rita. Rolly-poly, rumble-tumble, ruffle-puff, flop. When Papa drove into the yard two minutes later, he saw a great mound of soft snow, with two little black legs sticking out of it. 
Never mind, said Rita shortly when Papa had pulled her out, and she stood shaking the snow from her wet, rosy face. The old thing didn't hurt me a bit, and it broke it old self all to pieces. End of the Snowball by, Read by Krista Section 74 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Great Fight. The first I heard of it was when Fred came rushing into the house after breakfast. The enemy he cried. The enemy is upon us. Where? cried the rest of us, jumping up. In the battlefield, of course, he said, and he seized his flag and rushed out again. We followed as quickly as we could. I put on the helmet and Max took the drum, and we let Toddles have the bugle this time, because he had just tumbled down, and he had the hearth broom too, so he was all right. We ran into the field and found that the enemy had taken up a strong position behind the old cannon. Ours is a real battlefield, you know, and has been there ever since the war. We formed in line and Fred made a flank movement, meaning to take the enemy in the rear. But when he heard Fred coming, he charged on our line and Toddles ran away, but Max and I retreated in good order and formed again behind a rock and began to shell him with green apples. He stopped to eat the apples, and meanwhile Fred completed his flank movement, and falling on the enemy's rear, whacked it violently with a stick, waving his flag all the time, and shouting, Yield! Caitiff! Yield! Craven Hound! I tell him that nowadays people don't say those things in war, but he says that Roland and Bayard did and that what suited them will suit him. Well, the enemy turned suddenly on Fred and drove him back against the cannon, but by that time we had advanced again, and Toddles was blowing the bugle as hard as he could, which seemed to disconcert the foe. Fred took a flying leap from the cannon right over his back, and putting himself at our head, rallied us for a grand charge. We rushed forward, driving the enemy before us. A panic seized him, and he fled in disorder. We pursued him as far as the fence, and he got through a hole and escaped, but not before we each had a good whack at him. It was a glorious victory. Fred made us a speech afterward from the top of the cannon, and we all waved everything we had to wave, and vowed to slay the invader if ever he dared to show his nose on our side of the fence again. So that was all. Who was the enemy? Why didn't I say? Farmer Thurston's pig, of course. End of A Great Fight Section 75 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Hallelujah! The trees were still bare and the grass brown and sere in the northern city, but the sky was blue and cloudless and the air warm and soft. On a bench under one of the leafless trees in the park sat an old man, gray-haired and poorly clad. His eyes were fixed on the ground, and he was thinking of many sorrowful things. Suddenly he heard a little clear voice saying, Don't they give you any flowers? He looked up and saw a little wee girl standing before him with her hands full of flowers. She had a round, rosy face and round blue eyes and a little round rosebud of a mouth, and she was looking at him very seriously indeed. Didn't they give you any flowers? she repeated. No, dear, 
said the old man gently. Nobody gave me any flowers. Where did you get your pretty posies? In church, of course, said the child. The minister gives us all flowers. You shall have some of mine. And she took some sprays of lily of the valley and a red rose and laid them in the old man's withered hand. Does that make you glad? she asked anxiously. The minister says everybody must be glad today. Why must everybody be glad, my little angel? asked the old man sadly. Because Christ the Lord is risen, said the child. Didn't you know that? Don't you know that this is Easter day? The old man smiled and raised the flowers to his lips and kissed them. I have been ill, my little angel, he said. But you have made me almost well again, and I will be glad. Christ the Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah, cried the child eagerly. Hallelujah, echoed the old man reverently. Hallelujah, sang the bluebird in the leafless tree. Hallelujah, said the whole wide world. End of Hallelujah Section 76 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Kansas. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Lullaby. Lullaby, little lad. Shut thine eyes, gay and glad. Make thy mouth a folded rose. Tilt not up thy tiny nose. Little heart must beat, beat. Little head must slumber sweet. Lullaby, little boy, mother's love, mother's joy. End of lullaby. Section 77 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Merry Christmas. I am going to be merry all day long, announced Wilfred over his baked potato. It is Merry Christmas, and I'm going to show you how to be merry. How? queried Ben and Kitty. Why, it's just, just to be merry, replied Wilfred loftily. No matter what happens, all day long, we must laugh. If you fall downstairs, Ben, as you did yesterday, instead of howling, just laugh. You'll see. Ow! This potato is awfully hot. I've burnt my finger like fun. Ha ha ha! shouted Ben and Kitty as loud as they could. What are you laughing at, I should like to know, cried their brother, looking up rather savagely from the finger he was nursing. I don't see the joke. Guess if it was your finger. Merry Christmas, cried Ben. We are laughing because you told us to, Willie, said Kitty. Oh, isn't it funny? Brother burned his finger. Why don't you laugh too, Willie? Wilfred was silent a moment. Then he gave a forced laugh. <laughs> of course, he said, glancing rather sheepishly in the direction of Papa who sat quiet behind his newspaper and appeared to be taking no notice. But you never can tell whether he really is or not, he reflected. Of course, I didn't say I should laugh if you hurt yourselves, children, but it's all right. You see, I laugh, <laughs> though I really hurt myself very much indeed, with another glance at Papa. Come now, what shall we play till it's time to get ready for church? I vote for old man, I'm on your castle. We can play right on the hearth rug here, and I'll be old man. I want to be old man, protested little Kitty. 
"'You's always old man, Willie, "'cause I'm the oldest,' responded her brother promptly. "'Come on, Kitty, and laugh, you know. "'Don't look as if I had trodden on your toes "'just because you want to be old man. "'We must laugh all the more "'when we don't get the things we want, don't you see?' The game went on merrily, and all three were laughing with right good will, when Wilfred caught his foot in a corner of the rug and fell, striking his head pretty sharply against the table. He was dazed for a moment, but as the children's laughter rang out, he started to his feet with looks of fury. "'You hateful little things!' he began crimson with rage. But at this moment, another laugh was heard. Papa put down his newspaper and began, ha, 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 ho, 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 this is Merry Christmas indeed. Why don't you laugh, Wilfred, my boy? Ho, ho, this is remarkably funny. Why don't you laugh? Why, this is the best joke I have heard today. Go to your mother, dear, and ask her to put some arnica on your head, but don't forget to laugh all the way. That is the worst of Papa, said Wilfred to himself as he went slowly upstairs rubbing his head and casting baleful glances at the two little laughing children. He always makes you do things when you say you were going to, even if they don't turn out a bit the way you thought they would. End of Merry Christmas. Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA. Section 78 of 5 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA. 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Little Dog with the Green Tail An Untrue Story. Once upon a time, there came to the town where all the little dogs live a strange little dog whose tail was of a most beautiful bright green color, so bright that it shone like an emerald. Now when all the other little dogs saw this, they were filled with admiration and envy, and they ran to the strange little dog and said, Oh, little dog, what makes your tail so beautifully green? Pray tell us that we may make ours green too, for we never saw anything so lovely in all our lives. But the strange little dog laughed and said, There are many things greener than my tail. There is the grass down in the meadow. Go and ask that what makes it green, and perhaps it will tell you. So all the little dogs ran down into the meadow where the grass was growing, and they said, Oh, grass, grass, what makes you so green? Pray tell us that we may all get green tails like the tail of the strange little dog. But all the little blades of grass shook their heads and said, We can tell you nothing about that. All we know is that we were down under the ground last winter, and that when we came up this spring, we were all green. You might try that, and perhaps it would make you green too. So all the little dogs went to work as fast as they could and dug holes in the ground, and then they got into them and covered themselves up with earth. But they very soon found they could not breathe. So they were all obliged to come up again. And when they looked at each other, they saw to their sorrow that they were not green at all, but just the same colors that they were before. Some black, some brown, and some spotted. Then they all went again to the little dog and said, Oh, little dog, little dog! We have been to the grass, and it has not helped us at all. Now, do please tell us, what makes your tail so beautifully green? For we never can be happy till ours are like it. But the strange little dog only laughed again and answered, My tail is not the only green thing in the world. There are the leaves on the great oak tree. They are very green indeed. Go ask them what makes them so, and perhaps they will tell you. So all the little dogs ran as fast as they could to the great oak tree and called out to the little leaves, Oh, little leaves, what makes you so beautifully green? Do tell us that we may all get green tails like the tail of the strange little dog. But the leaves all shook their heads and said, We know nothing about that. We came out of our buds last spring, and then we were very pale. But we danced about 
and the more we danced, the greener we grew. Perhaps if you come up here and dance, you will grow green too. So all the little dogs climbed up the tree as fast as they could and tried to dance about on the branches. But they were not fastened on like the little leaves, so they fell down and hurt themselves very much. And when they got up and looked at each other, they were not any greener than before. So then they all cried bitterly, and they ran once more to the strange little dog and said, Oh, little dog, little dog, we have tried the way that the leaves told us, and we have only hurt ourselves dreadfully and have not got green at all. And now, if you do not tell us, we shall die of grief, for we never can rest again till our tails are green. But the strange little dog only laughed more than ever and said, What stupid creatures you are to think that there is nothing green in the world except my tail. There is the sea. He is twenty times as green as my tail. Go and ask him, and he will surely tell you all about it, for he is very wise and knows everything. So all the little dogs ran as fast as they could down to the shore, and there was the great hungry sea, prowling up and down, twirling his white mustaches and tossing his white hair and looking very green and very fierce. The little dogs were very much frightened, but they took courage when they thought of the beautiful green tail, and they said, trembling, Oh, great sea, the strange little dog told us that you were wise and knew everything, and that you would tell us how to make our tails green like his. The great sea smiled wickedly and answered, Oh, yes, my children, I can tell you. I am green myself, and I make everything green that touches me. So let me take you in my arms a moment, and you will become beautifully green just like me. So the great hungry sea held out his long green arms and beckoned to them with his white hands. And the poor little dogs all shut their eyes and jumped in. And in less than a minute, the sea gobbled them all up so that not one was left. And there was an end of all the little dogs. And the strange little dog went back to the place he came from with his green tail curled up behind him, and he was never seen or heard of again. End of The Little Dog with the Green Tail, An Untrue Story Recording by Katherine Russell, Ohio, USA Section 79 of Five Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Kansas. Five Minute Stories by Laura Richards. Naughty. I took the sugar tongs and tried to curl my doggie's hair. I heated them until they burned which filled him with despair. The sugar tongs were spoiled, and the hair would not curl, and now I'm sent to bed, an unhappy little girl. End of Naughty Section 80 of Five Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Hard Times. No Christmas for us this year, said Fred, coming out of his father's study, with his hands in his empty pockets, and a blank look on his face. No Christmas, cried Edith. What do you mean, Fred? Hard times, said her brother. Father says he shall have all he can do to get through the winter, and that we mustn't expect presents or anything of that kind. Of course it's all right. Only... It will seem queer, won't it? Oh, no money Christmas, said Edith, looking relieved. Yes, I knew that before. 
but we can have a merry Christmas, Fred, without money. I mean to have a particularly merry one, and you must help me. I should like to know what you can do without any money. Wait and see, and come out into the woods with me this afternoon. That's a good boy. It was about a month before Christmas when this conversation took place, and all through December there were no busier young people in Woodville than Fred and Edith Brown. They slighted none of their lessons, but Fred spent a good part of his home time in the barn, with a hammer in his hand and a Latin grammar at his elbow, while Edith's knitting needles flew as she bent over her history lesson. The day before Christmas, Papa and Mama were summoned to dine and spend the day with Grandmama. Mama rather wondered that the children were not invited, and did not want to go without them, but their faces grew direfully long at this suggestion that she saw through the little plot. But Papa did not, and she cheerfully took her shawl and departed, charging Edith to keep up the fire, and Fred to take care of the house. When the parents returned in the evening, the house was a bower of green. Here is one thing that costs nothing, Edith had said, and it is half of a merry Christmas. So she and Fred had brought great armfuls of fragrant cedar and hemlock, and tall fir saplings, which were set up in every corner, while wreaths hung in the windows, and long garlands festooned fireplace and picture frames. Papa looked very much pleased. "'Why, it is Christmas already,' he said, "'and I thought we should not have any celebration at all this year. "'You were too bright for me, children.' "'It's all Edith, Papa,' said honest Fred. "'All but about two-thirds, Papa,' said Edith. "'I could have done nothing without Fred's strong arms.' Next morning the sun was out, and the snow sparkled like diamonds in the golden light. "'Here is something else that costs nothing, Edie,' cried Fred who had entered heart and soul into his sister's idea. Sunshine is a pretty good present, isn't it? And we have the very best article today. Hurrah! cried Edith. This is glorious! Merry Christmas, boy! Smiles are another thing, Fred. Let's be sure not to look gloomy for a single minute all day. All right, said Fred. I'll grin like the Cheshire cat from morning till night. Now, here's Mother's work table already. It has taken a good polish, hasn't it? Splendid, cried Edith. And here's Father's portfolio. Do you recognize the cover, Fred? Looks like that pretty dress you had ever so long ago, when you were a little shaver. I mean, shaveress. Just what it is. The pieces were folded away all this time, of no use to anybody and there was enough to make this pretty work-bag for Mother, and another like it for Aunt May. And look here, Fred. Merry Christmas, dear old fellow. Fred looked at the blue and gray toboggan cap with astonishment and delight. Oh, sis, that is a stunner. But I say, you have broken the rule. This wool must have cost you something, and a good deal. Not a penny, rejoined his sister triumphantly. Do you remember that huge old comforter that Aunt Eliza sent me three years ago? I never could wear it out, though it was just as dear and kind of her to make it for me. That gave me the wool for the cap, and for several other things besides. Well, it is a beauty, said Fred. Here's all the present I have for you, and I wish it was a better one. He produced a birch bark basket, filled with chestnuts and hickories, and was rewarded by a good old-fashioned hug. "'As if you could have found anything I should have liked better,' cried Edith. "'Such beauties, too. Why, you must have picked out every single nut, Fred Brown.' "'Something like it,' admitted Fred. "'How about those partridges for dinner?' "'They are all ready to put in the oven,' Edith said. "'Mother knows nothing about them yet, but is sighing a little because she has no chicken for us. And you know Mrs. Spicer gave me a jar of mincemeat for the cranberries I brought her. I am a little proud of my pie, Fred. Hurrah for you, said Fred. Somehow or other, the Browns had never had a merrier Christmas than this one of the hard winter. 
Edith said it was all the sunshine and the green boughs. Fred said it was all Edith. But Mr. and Mrs. Brown, as they sat by the cheerful hearth, and watched the chestnuts roasting, and listened to the merry young voices, gave reverent thanks for their treasure of love, and felt that they were rich in spite of the hard times. End of Hard Times Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 81 of 5-Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 5-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards on the steeple. Weathercock up on the steeple, flap your wings and crow. Weathercock, plenty of people, say that you can't, you know. But I know better, I hear you, and Johnny Boy hears you too. When you think that there's no one near you, cry cock a doodle do. End of On the Steeple. Section 82 of 5 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards, Naughty Billy. Billy put the puppy dog in the water pail. Billy tied the toasting fork to the kitten's tail. Puppy bit his naughty legs. Kitty scratched his nose. Somebody is screaming now. Who do you suppose? End of Naughty Billy. Section 83 of 5-Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 5-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A lad. There was a lad whose name was Chad. He had a brother whose name was Bother. He had a sister whose name was Twister. He had an uncle whose name was Bunkle. He had an aunt. Tell her name, I shan't. End of A Lad. Section 84 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Kansas. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. St. Valentine's House. Do you know, children, how and where all valentines are made that you see in the shops nowadays? Well, suppose I tell you all about it. When you go to Fairyland, turn to the left after you enter the gate, and the first house you come to will be St. Valentine's. This is what I did when I went there, and you shall hear what I saw on entering the house. I found myself in a large hall hung with gold and silver paper and glittering with an incomparable brightness. Here were hundreds of little cupids with tiny wings who were running and flying about as busy as bees. One was carrying a roll of gold paper as big as himself. Another was painting beautiful flowers on white paper. Others were making paper lace. But all seemed to be helping and waiting on a person who sat by a huge table at the farther end of the hall, and this person I soon found to be St. Valentine himself. He was a young man and very handsome. He was dressed in sky-blue velvet, embroidered with gold, and had great fat pearls for buttons. He seemed as busy as the rest, and merely nodded and smiled when he saw me, and called out, Number three shears, approach, my dears. I heard a queer, sharp voice at my elbow, saying, Now, then, by your leave and turning, saw at my elbow a enormous pair of shears walking about on two legs 
and looking as proud as you please. Dear number threes, a million sevens, if you please, said St. Valentine. Snip, snap, snip, snap, went the shears, and there lay a million little sheets of white paper. Then the saint cried, Bring me some hearts and flaming darts, and a dozen cupids came up dragging a great basket full of hearts and carrying bundles of darts under their arms. Quick as lightning, St. Valentine took a couple of hearts out of the baskets, clapped them on a sheet of paper, stuck a dart into them, flung the wreath of flowers around them, then, thump, a great stamp came down on the paper, and out of it came a lovely valentine. That was quick work. In five minutes? I should think five hundred valentines were turned out. I stood looking on in delight. Suddenly the saint called out, A big one, let us now begin, and let us put the lady in. At first I did not know what he meant, but he took an enormous sheet, and after showering hearts and roses and cupids on it, turned to me and said sweetly, now, if you will venture in it, I'll stamp you out in half a minute. This was too much, and making him a low bow, I awoke. End of St. Valentine's House Section 85 of 5 Minute Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards The Gentleman There once was an elderly gentleman whose manners were soft and mild. He doffed his hat to each woman he met. He kissed his hand to each child. He smiled and he bowed to meek and proud. And thus to himself said he, A gentleman I, as none can deny, So gentle I still must be. A walking he went in a lane one day, A lane that was long and narrow, And there in the path a rustic lay, Beside his plough and harrow. A ruffian and a gruffian he, A horrid rustic for to see. And all in the way he spoke, prowling lay and never a foot budged he i pray you worthy friend to rise the gentleman mildly said but the ruffian glared with his ugly eyes and shook his ugly head the ditch is wide on either side and dry enough quoth he there's room to pass old timothy grass without disturbing me the gentleman smiled a charming smile, and bowed a gracious bow, and looking around with his glass the while, he spied a grazing cow. As sure as I live, a lesson I'll give, thought he, to my rustic friend. I'll warrant me yet he'll not forget this day to his life's long end. The rustic lay in the path and snored. The cow ate grass and lowed. The gentleman took her and gently shook her and led her along the road. Then he took a string and an iron ring and the end of the cow's loose tether and harrow and plough and ruffian and cow he fastened them all together. And now, my friend, he sweetly said, since you have not the strength to rise, the means for a ride I am glad to provide, and I trust that the same you'll prize. He pulled a switch from the wayside ditch, gave Mooley a sounding blow, and off with a wallop she set at a gallop as fast as her legs could go. The rustic, the plough, and the harrow went too, a bumping along the stones. The rustic did yell, oh, and Mooley did bellow. You'd think they were breaking their bones. But the gentleman smiled, and pensive and mild, on his peaceful way went he. 
a gentleman, I, as none can deny, so gentle I still must be. End of The Gentleman Recording by Ezwa in Belgium in November 2015「5 Minute Stories」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Haak. 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. A Leap Year Boy Tomorrow is my birthday, said Robbie to Bobby. What is your birthday? said Bobby to Robbie. Why, tomorrow, silly, said Robbie. Now Robbie was nearly six years old and a person of great importance. I don't mean that, said little Bobby, who was not yet four. I mean, what is our birthday? Is it good to eat? Why, why, Bobby Dell. Don't you have birthdays, cried Robbie, opening his eyes. No, said Bobby, opening his mouth. I never saw one. You don't see them, said Robbie in a patronizing tone. You have them. It is the day you were born, and you have a party and presents and a birthday cake with frosting and your name on it in pink letters and candy and oranges and a gold dollar with grandmama's love to her dear little boy. Do you really mean that you have never had one, Bobby Bell? Little Bobby looked very grave. Perhaps I wasn't born, he said. I'm going to ask Mama. So he trotted in to his mother. Mama, he said, was I born? Mama looked at him a moment in mute surprise. Were you born, dear? she repeated. Yes, certainly, you were born. Why do you ask me that, little boy? Bobby's lip began to quiver and his blue eyes filled with tears. Then why? Why don't I have birthdays? he asked. Mama looked very sorry. Dear, dear, she said. Now who has been telling my leap year boy about birthdays? Come and sit in Mama's lap and tell me all about it. And then I will tell you all about it. So Bobby climbed up into Mama's lap and hid his face in her dress and sobbed out his little story about frosted cake and pink letters and gold dollars with Grandmama's love to her dear little boy. And I never, I never had any, he said piteously. Then Mama told Bobby a funny little story. It was about the years and it told how they came along one after another, and how each year had just the same number of days in it. Three hundred and sixty-five. So many days I've been alive. Storm and shine and sorrow and cheer. Really, there never was such a year. That is what each one says before it puts on its nightcap and goes to sleep. But every fourth year there comes one who is bigger than the rest. He has one day more, and he is very proud of it, and he holds his head very high and says, 366, one more day for frolicsome tricks, one day more for work and one for play. Look at me, look at me, one more day. And so, four years ago, said Mama, there came one of these extra days, and it was the very best day that any year ever brought for on that day my bobby was born think of that bobby laughed and clapped his little fat hands and so continued mamma of course my bobby couldn't have another birthday till another long year came round with another extra day and now whisper bobby now the long year has come and next friday is your birthday dear and you're going to have oh but i mustn't tell Mama laughed and shook her head and didn't tell any more, but her eyes told a great deal. And that was all Bobby wanted, for he was very fond of surprises and secrets. He hugged Mama, and then he hugged himself, and then he went and hugged the kitten and told her all about it. 
and what he thought he was going to have. Well, and it all came true and a great deal more, for Bobby had the finest birthday that ever any little boy had or any little girl either. In fact, it was so very fine that I couldn't possibly write about it in common black ink on white paper. I should have to take silver paper and gold ink, and I cannot do that, so I shall have to stop now. Isn't that too bad? End of A Leap Year Boy Section 87 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. King Pippin. Little King Pippin, he had a long nose. Little King Pippin wore doublet and hose, doublet and hose, and shoes for to trip in. This was the person of little King Pippin. Chorus. This was the person of little King Pippin. Little King Pippin, his soldiers were three. They drew out their swords and said, Fiddle dee dee. Where is the foe that is blood we may dip in? These were the soldiers of little King Pippin. Chorus. These were the soldiers of little King Pippin. Little King Pippin, his sailors were five. They thanked their dear stars that they yet were alive. Sure we should be drowned if the sea we should slip in. These were the sailors of little King Pippin. Chorus. These were the sailors of little King Pippin. Little King Pippin, his story is done. Little King Pippin, his battles are won. Never a fight that he did not whip in. What do you think of little King Pippin? Chorus. What do you think of little King Pippin? End of King Pippin Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 88 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Christy Cruz of Kansas. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Story of the Crimson Crab. The Crimson Crab was to be married to the eldest frog. The wedding guests were assembled on the great water lily leaf in their best dresses and best spirits. There were lizards and water beetles dragonflies and butterflies in fact all the best people of the neighborhood the musicians young frogs of remarkable talent were stationed with their instruments in the pink buds of the lily in the largest blossom the bride was completing her toilet but she wept as she polished her shining claws and her feelers shook with grief for she did not wish to marry the eldest frog. He was gray and grisly, had no voice save a dismal croak, and was known to have an odious temper. The crimson crab thought of the gallant young green frog whom she had met at the pollywog's ball. How handsome he was! She had danced nearly every dance with him, and he had pressed her claw tenderly and whispered sweet words in her ear then the next evening he came and sang beneath her window ah oh, how he sang when the song was over he leaped lightly upon the window sill poured out his tale of love 
and gained her promise to be his bride. Ah, moment of rapture! She thrilled even now with the recollection of it. But he vanished, and she had never seen him since. She was told that he had disappeared and probably gone to the Muskrat War and been killed in battle. Alone she sat and wept till her stern father came and told her that she was to be the bride of the eldest frog. Vain were her tears, vain her entreaties. Preparations for the wedding were at once begun. The fine clothes were ordered, and now the fatal day was come. Alas! cried the crimson crab. Why am I beautiful? Why does this lovely carmine mantle in my shining shell? If I were a plain green crab, the eldest frog would not have sought me out, and I might still sit in my lonely bower and weep for my lost love. At this moment her father's summons came, and she was forced to dry her tears. Console yourself, noble lady, cried her faithful attendant lizard. See the beautiful gifts your bridegroom has sent you. A girdle of pearls, a mantle of glittering fish scales, webs of gossamer, the finest that ever were seen. Never was a bride so richly decked, so generous a bridegroom as the eldest frog is sure to make a kind husband. But the bride only sighed the more, and sadly took her way toward the green leaf, whereon the wedding guests were assembled. The eldest frog was dressed in his best, his speckled coat was new, and his yellow breeches fitted to perfection but for all that he was old and ugly. He leered at the bride with his Google eyes and grinned till the two ends of his mouth nearly met behind. Croak, croak, he said, laying his hand on his heart. Ah, the fair bride. Ah, the lovely crimson. What happiness to win the love of such an exquisite creature. He held out his withered hand and advanced a step or two, but at the same instant a voice was heard, crying, Villain! Do not dare to touch her! And leaping across the lily leaf, his eyes flashing fire, his bulrush spear in his hand, came the green frog. With one thrust he sent the eldest frog sprawling on the floor, then, while all the company looked on aghast, he caught the crimson crab in his arms and hailed her as his bride. This villain lay in wait for me, he cried, and captured me unawares the very night when I last saw thee, my own. For weeks I have lain fast, bound hand and foot, in a dungeon deep under the mud, Today I was set free by a faithful horned pout, whom I had formerly befriended. Fly with me, my bright, my beautiful. My home among the reeds is lowly, but love will make it rich. Away, away! He seized the slender claw of the crimson crab, and before her father could prevent it, the two had leaped from the leaf and were scuttling swiftly through the clear water. All the guests followed, that is, all who could swim, to see what would become of the venturous young couple. The old crab went into his hole and sulked, while as for the eldest frog, he just lay on his back where his rival had thrown him, gasping and gurgling, and nobody took any notice of him, till at last... A fat brown duck came along and gobbled him up. End of the story of the crimson crab. Section 89 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abby. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Mother's Riddle. Mother has a kitten, mother has a mouse. Mother has a bird that sings all about the house. Mother has a lammy, mother has a chick. Altogether, half at two feet. Guess my riddle quick. End of section 89. Section 90 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. King John. I'm learning a lesson upon King John. A very great rascal was he. He murdered Prince Arthur, cause England would rather the prince should her sovereign be. I'm learning a lesson upon King John. A coward and craven was he. Up rose every baron and said, We'll make war on this king as our worst enemy. They beat him in many a field. Now yield, cried they, or your grace we must slay. Or else let us barter, you'll sign Magna Carta, and we'll take the soldiers away. He signed in a terrible hurry and flurry, but soon as the soldiers were gone, this pitiful fellow did shriek, howl, and bellow to think of the thing he had done. He bit and he scratched and he kicked and licked every person that came in his way. He murdered their spouses and burned up their houses, behaved in an odious way. One night he took tea with some monks, old hunks, just to save his own supper at home. But he put on such airs that they poisoned his pears, which concludes both his life and my poem. End of King John Section 91 of Five Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abby. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Spotty Cow. My Spotty Cow, my Spotty Cow, I love you very dearly. I think you are the fairest beast in all the wide world nearly. My kitty cat is also sweet, but then she has no spots. Well, you, my pleasant spotty cow, have lots and lots and lots. The king of Spain may be grand, the queen of England too. They cannot have my spotty cow, whatever they may do. But if they both should bring me their gold and gems and silk, I might perhaps, I might give them a very little milk. End of section 91. Section 92 of 5 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Kansas. 5 Minute Stories by Laura Richards. The Button Pie A button pie, a button pie, it was our fondest wish. We took the nursery buttons and put them in a dish. We mixed them well with sawdust, squeezed out of Dolly's arm, and some of Nursie's hair oil, not thinking any harm. And then we set the pie to bake beneath the sewing table, and went to play a little while with Johnny's horse and stable. But Nursey came and whisked her gown, and over went the pie. I think I will not tell the rest, for fear that I should cry.
End of the Button Pie Section 93 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Z. Martine. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Inquisitive Ducks. Once upon a time there were some children and once upon a time there were some ducks. It was upon the same time, too, and they all lived together in one house. That was funny, wasn't it? And there were two reasons for it. In the first place, it was so cold where they lived that the ducks could not stay out of doors except in summer. And in the second place, the good man of the house, the children's father, was so poor that he could not afford to have a separate house for the ducks. Indeed, there were only three rooms in the house. One was the kitchen, which was parlor and dining room and sitting room as well, and one was the children's room, and the third was the parents' room. So there they all lived together, and they were very sociable. The names of the children were Greta, Mina, Lisa, Carl, and Baby Fritz. The names of the ducks were Redtop, Waggletail, Gobbler, and Spottletoe. And the children were all good, but the ducks were all naughty, as you shall hear. The father had made a nice wooden box for the ducks, and this was always filled with hay and kept beside the great porcelain stove in winter, so that the pets might be warm. But were they grateful for this kindness? Not a bit of it. They were always getting out of their box and poking their bills into all sorts of places where they had no business to be. You might find Waggletail inside the mother's Sunday cap and Gobbler tasting the soup on the table, and Redtop and Spottletoe pulling the baby's doll to pieces. These were things that happened every day. And indeed, what else can be expected when one keeps one's ducks in the kitchen? But one day, something very much worse than all this came. The mother was ill, so ill that she was obliged to stay in bed and send for the doctor, and that was something very unusual. The doctor came and gave her a box of pills, telling her to take one pill every day until she was better. He told her to put her feet in a hot mustard bath, as that would draw the pain down from her head, and he patted the children, and mounting his old gray pony, rode away again. Well, the mother took her pill, and then closed her eyes for a short nap, laying the pill box down on the low stool beside the bed. Presently, Greta, the eldest daughter, came in with a hot foot bath, and seeing her mother asleep, set it down softly and went out again to get the warm shawl that the good woman would need when she sat up. Now it happened that she left the door open, and as this was what the four ducks had been waiting for all day, they immediately waddled into the mother's room. Poking about in their usual way, they soon found the box of pills, and supposing them to be something particularly nice, they gobbled them all up in the twinkling of an eye. Now, you know that pills are not apt to be nice, and these pills were very particularly nasty, as the ducks soon found out. "'What's this?' said Gobbler. "'Ugh! Quack! Ugh! What is it?' exclaimed Redtop. Waggletail had swallowed four pills, and his feelings were too deep for words. His one thought was, "'Something to drink!' And seeing the footbath, he plunged his bill in and took a good draught of the hot mustard and water. Oh, then what a clamor arose! The other ducks had hastened to follow his example, and now they were all screaming and sputtering and flapping their wings in a way that was dreadful to hear. The poor mother woke up in a fright. Greta and all the children came rushing in, followed by the dog. Finally the father came in, armed with a heavy stick, and the terrified ducks were driven out of doors, where they sat, shivering, on the doorstep, declaring that they would never eat or drink anything again. End of The Inquisitive Ducks Section 94 of 5-Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Kansas. 5-Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Queen Matilda. Oh, Queen Matilda baked 
and Queen Matilda brewed, and Queen Matilda taught her boys they never should be rude. Take off your hat, wipe your shoes upon the mat. When you help yourself to butter, only take a single pat. Oh, Queen Matilda sewed, and Queen Matilda span, and Queen Matilda taught her boys the duties of a man. Keep your mouth shut, don't give way to if or but, don't employ your little toofies when you wish to crack a nut. End of Queen Matilda Section number 95 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Judy Derby. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Two Shoes Chair. For Betty. When the baby eyes are heavy, when the baby feet are sore, when she cannot go a singing and a springing any more, then the baby and her mother, oh, the happy, happy pair, they turn to seek the shelter of the two shoes chair. Oh, the two shoes chair, oh, the two shoes chair, tis there we seek for pleasure. And is there we hide from care. And all the little troubles, They float away like bubbles, As we sit and rock together In the two-shoes chair. Has the dolly's head been broken? Has the dolly's frock been torn? Has Johnny gone to play with boys And left her all forlorn? Still her little heart is cheery, And she yields not to despair. She can always have her mother and the two shoes chair. Oh, the two shoes chair, oh, the two shoes chair. Tis there we seek for pleasure, and tis there we hide from care. And all the little troubles, they float away like bubbles, as we sit and rock together in the two shoes chair. When a bump is on her forehead, or a bruise is on her knee, when the kitten has been horrid, just as horrid as can be. Then she climbs her coin of vantage and is sure of comfort there, for her mother's arms are round her in the two-shoes chair. Oh, the two-shoes chair, oh, the two-shoes chair, tis there we seek for pleasure and tis there we hide from care. And all the little troubles, they float away like bubbles, as we sit and rock together in the two-shoes chair. But best of all, when twilight comes softly down the sky, when birds are crooning on the bough their lulla lullaby, when all the stars are ready to light her to her beddy, tis then she loves to linger in the two-shoes chair. Oh, the two-shoes chair, oh, the two-shoes chair, Tis there we seek for pleasure, and tis there we hide from care. And all the little troubles, they float away like bubbles, as we sit and rock together in the two-shoes chair. End of The Two-Shoes Chair Recording by Judy Derby Section 96 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Z. Martine. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Ethelred the Unready. Ethelred Unready. He would not go to Betty sat up all night till his nurse died of fright with a nightcap over his heady. End of Ethelred the Unready
Section 97 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tanya Goffman. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. Poor Bonnie, a true story. Bonnie was only six years old when it happened. He went to the mill one day with his uncle, riding in front of him on the old gray mare, while the bags of corn hung over on each side. While Uncle Alan talked with the miller, Bonnie ran about, peeping here and there, and at last he strayed off into the pasture to see the red calf with the three spots on its nose. He was gone so long that Uncle Alan thought he had run away home so he rode off with two bags of flour instead of the corn. Bonnie was rather frightened when he found he must go home alone through the woods, a distance of three miles, but he was a sturdy little fellow and would not let the miller know that he was afraid. Off he trudged with his hands in his pockets, whistling the merriest tune he knew to keep his courage up. tra la lira la very gaily it sounded through the bare woods, for it was early spring and the leaves were only just beginning to break out of their woolly coverings. The red squirrels came out of their holes to look at him, and the little wood mice sat and chattered at the doors of their houses. Bonnie was used to these little creatures and only whistled louder when he saw them, but presently he came to something that made him stop whistling and open his mouth very wide indeed with surprise. On the stump of a fallen tree sat a great bird with mottled feathers, which spread around and over the stump. It was a wild turkey Bonnie knew, for Uncle Alan had told him just what they looked like, though he had never seen one. When the turkey saw him, she rose up for a moment, and he saw that she was sitting on a nest full of brown eggs. Then she settled down again folded her wings over her treasure, and glared fiercely at the intruder. Bonnie stood quite still for some time, wondering what he should do. He wanted the eggs, not all, but just a few to show Uncle Alan. But the turkey was very large and very fierce-looking, with her glaring yellow eyes and her sharp beak, and Bonnie was only six years old. On the whole, he thought the wisest plan would be to go straight home and tell Uncle Alan about it, and then they would come together and drive the turkey away and get a few of the beautiful mottled eggs. Full of his new idea, the little fellow ran on and finally reached home before dark. But here a sad disappointment awaited him, for Uncle Alan, Bonnie had no father or mother and lived with his uncle would not believe that he had seen a wild turkey at all. Pooh, pooh, he said. Nonsense, my lad. You saw a partridge, or it might be a hen that had stolen a nest, as the saying is. There are no wild turkeys about here that I ever heard of. Get your supper now and go to bed like a good little lad. We have had a fine worry about you, thinking you were lost. Bonnie knew it was a wild turkey that he had seen, and he was very unhappy because his story was only half believed. If I could only have got an egg, he said to himself over and over. If I had only one egg to show, they would know that I am right. But I know it, I do, I do. He ate his supper and went to bed with his head full of the wild turkey, but he was so tired that he fell asleep in spite of himself. It seemed as if Bonnie had only been asleep five minutes when something struck him very hard on the head and woke him up. He cried out and opened his eyes in a great fright. Where was he? Why was he so cold? Why were his feet wet? At first the child was bewildered with fright and amazement, but when he came to himself he found that he was standing in the midst of a wood, alone, barefooted, clad only in his little flannel nightgown in the dead of night. Poor Bonnie, poor little lad! And what was he holding up in his nightgown, holding tight with both hands? 
he let go his hold, and down fell the wild turkey's eggs. The child had walked there in his sleep, and had found the bird gone, or else driven her away. He never could know which. As he raised his head after gathering up the eggs, a branch must have struck him on the head and waked him. But, oh, to get home! It was so cold, so wet! He shivered with fear, as well as with the chill, but this time he would not go back empty-handed. Surely the eggs could not be all broken? No, here was one whole one! Clasp it tight, little Bonnie, and run! Follow your own little footprints, pit-pat, pit-pat, back through the dark woods, the moon shining through the trees, and making just enough light for you to see your way across the meadow, up the lane, and then, oh, scamper, run, rush over the home field, home, home at last. Pit-pat, softly up the back stairs, after closing the door, which he found swinging wide open, and the little shivering figure crept into its little bed, cuddled down under the bedclothes, and lay as still as a mouse. Great was the outcry in the morning when Bonnie told his story. Poo, poo, nonsense, cried Uncle Alan. But there was the turkey's egg, and there were the little muddy footprints at the back door and up the stairs. Then Uncle Alan followed the tracks and went himself across the field, and down the lane, and over the meadow, and through the wood. And when he came to the nest on the stump and the broken eggs, with the print of the little bare feet close by, he said, Well, well, I declare, now I do. And he went home and gave Bonnie a big orange and ten cents and his old jackknife. But Aunt Lucy kept him in bed till noon, and made him drink hot lemonade every hour to take out the cold. And he had the kitten to play with, and Grandma's spectacles, and he didn't catch cold after all. End of Poor Bonnie, A True Story Recording by Tanya Goffman Section 98 of 5 Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. 5 Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Husking of the Corn. When the autumn winds are merry and come piping o'er the lea, Kiss the lassies' cheeks to cherry, toss their curls in frolic glee. Then the neighbor children gather at the sound of robin's horn, trooping to the barn together for the husking of the corn. There the floor is swept so trimly, ready for the pleasant play. There the light falls soft and dimly down the hills of fragrant hay. There the pumpkins and the squashes in a circle ranged complete, for the laddies and the lassies make for each a royal seat. On our golden stools a sitting, each beside a pile of corn, lightly goes the laughter flitting while the rustling husks are torn, and the yellow ears and gleaming pile we high before us there, till a wondrous castle seeming all of gold we've builded fair. Then, when all is finished, Robin brings the apples glowing red, chestnuts in their satin jackets, cookies crisp and gingerbread, and we feast with song and laughter, and we make the echoes ring, till each ancient cobwebbed rafter shakes to hear our reveling. Till the rising moon is jealous, envying our merry play, through the window peeps to tell us, Hence to bed, away, away. So with parting jest and greeting, Troop the neighbor children home, Looking to another meeting, When a holiday shall come. City children, you who wonder How the country bumpkins live, Know we would not join you yonder For all the joys that you could give. Keep your shops, your smoky weather, Keep your looks of pitying scorn, 
you can never troop together to the husking of the corn. End of The Husking of the Corn Section 99 of 5 Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Thomas. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Clever Cheesemaker. Once upon a time, there lived, in a little straw hut, a poor cheesemaker and his wife. They made good cheeses and sold them whenever they could, but they lived in a lonely spot and few people passed by that way, so that they made but a slender living. Now it chanced one day that when the good wife came to count the cheeses, she found there were six missing, although she had not sold any or given any away. She said to her husband, Some thief has stolen six cheeses in the night. Good, said the husband. Bad, said the wife. Good, I tell you, cried the husband. We'll watch tonight and catch the thief, and tomorrow we will take him before the judge and ask that he be forced to pay us twice the value of the cheeses. Good, said the wife. What a clever fellow you are. Oh, I have not a pumpkin on my shoulders, said the husband, chuckling. Accordingly, the husband and wife concealed themselves under the bed the next night and watched to see what would happen. About midnight, the door opened softly and in came a large brown monkey. He looked all about and, seeing no one, went to the cheese cupboard, took three of the finest cheeses and made off. The wife was for following him, but the husband said, No, let us wait and see if he comes again. So they waited, and sure enough the monkey returned in a few minutes, and taking three more cheeses, went off again. This time the man followed him. Holding the cheeses carefully in his arms, the monkey took his way through the woods till he came to the mouth of a cave into which he ran. The cheesemakers slipped noiselessly after him. They went through a dark, winding passage which led to a vaulted chamber hollowed in the solid rock. Here the monkey entered, while the man concealed himself behind a point of rock and peeped after him. The room was full of monkeys, and at the farther end sat the Monkey King, on a throne made of a huge mass of gold. The cheesemakers stared at that, for he had never seen such a sight. When the Monkey King saw the cheese, he howled with delight, seized the largest one, and gobbled it up. When the cheesemaker saw that, he turned about and went home again, for he needed to see no more, having a head on his shoulders and not a pumpkin. How now? asked his wife. You come back without cheeses? Hold your tongue, good wife, he said. Knowledge is better than cheese. Truly, said the wife scornfully, it must be fine knowledge to be worth six of my best cheeses. The next night the man hid himself behind the door of his hut, and when the monkey thief appeared, he sprang out and caught him by his long tail. Here, wife, he cried, bring me your shears that I might cut off this fellow's towel for a rope to beat him with. Ay, ay, screamed the monkey, do not cut off my handsome tail, spare me and I will give you whatever you wish. Do you mean it? asked the cheesemaker, giving the tail a twist. Ay, ay, said the monkey, I swear it upon my honour. Then, said the cheesemaker, go and bring me a lump of gold from the king's throne as big as my fist and you shall have your freedom and a cheese besides. The monkey, glad to escape so easily, hastened away and soon returned with the lump of gold. What do you want with this yellow stuff? he asked. It is only fit to make chairs of. Well, I might want to make a chair some day, replied the cheesemaker. The door will be locked after this, he added. But whenever your master wants cheese, you know how to get it. It happened in this way that the cheesemaker and his wife grew very rich for the monkeys constantly came to buy cheese, and they always paid for it with lumps of gold. Soon the straw hut disappeared, and in its stead rose a stately house of stone, with gardens and terraces about it. The cheesemaker wore a velvet coat, and his wife flaunted about in a satin gown. But still, they never failed to make their cheeses twice a week. Why do you still make cheese? asked the fine visitors who came to see them rolling in gilded coaches. But the cheesemaker had one answer for them all because I have a head on my shoulders and not a pumpkin. End of The Clever Cheesemaker Recording by Mark Thomas Section 100 of 5-Minute Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Cruz of Kansas. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Spelling Lesson. The teacher sat in her high back chair, her chair so straight and tall, her eyes went flashing to and fro among the children small. At last she spoke, and Billy Boy, now answer Billy Bo Lee, and tell me quickly. What does C O W spell? Quoth she. Then up went Patty's hand, up went Maddie's hand, up went Freddie's hand too. But poor little Billy, he was so silly, he didn't know what to do. The teacher smiled her pleasant smile and shook her small wise head. Be quiet, all, for I am sure. That Billy knows, she said. Put on your thinking cap, my child, and tie it very tight. Then C-O-W will not trouble you, and you will say it right. But up went Patty's hand, up went Maddie's hand, up went Freddie's hand, too. And poor little Billy, he was so silly, he didn't know what to do. But when the children gan to laugh, and fun at him gan poke, poor Billy thought it might not be so much worse if he spoke. So lifting up his fearful eyes, all sad and timorously, sure, C O W must spell sobble you. Thus spoke Billy Bowley. Then out laughed Maddie, and out laughed Patty, and out laughed Frederick, too. But poor little Billy, he felt so silly, he didn't know what to do. End of the spelling lesson. Section 101 of Five Minute Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cam Yao. Five Minute Stories by Laura E. Richards. The Person Who Did Not Like Cats. Once upon a time, there was a person who did not like cats. She did not like dogs either, but she never said anything about that, because the big master and the little two masters and the four little mistresses were all very fond of dogs and liked to have them lie around under everybody's feet and get white hairs all over everybody's clothes and take up the whole hearth rug and run away with the roast beef and bark to be let out and then howl to be let in and shake themselves when they were wet and do all the things that dogs do. They all liked these things, so the person who did not like cats never dared say a word. But nobody cared very much about cats, except when they were little downy kittens, and they will not stay kittens, save Maggie, the cook. So the person felt free to speak her mind, and said she would not have any cats in the house. And after she said that, these things happened. One day, a kitten belonging to the neighbor's little boy came into the kitchen and refused to go out again. The little boy was sent for, and he came and took the kitten home. Next day, it came again and was taken home again, and so it went on for a week, till everyone in the house was tired out with carrying that kitten home, and the kitten's little boy cried and thought it was too bad. It was. But the kitten was very happy, and Maggie, the cook, said she couldn't let the crather starve, so it stayed. And pretty soon it was not a kitten any more, but a cat, and it had kittens of its own, one of which was given to the little boy. Now the person who did not like cats said the other kittens must be taken away in a bag, 
But all the little masters and mistresses cried out and said, "Oh, mamma, please, mamma, the dear sweet little things, see their little paws, see their little noses, hear them squeal. We must keep this one, mamma. We can't possibly part with that one, mamma. Oh, mamma, dear mamma, feel this one's little back." And so on and so on. So the person said they might keep the one which they all thought the prettiest, and that the others must go away in a bag. But while they were deciding, the kittens grew up and became cats. So then the bag was not big enough to hold them, and they stayed. Partly for that reason, and partly because they were all so ugly, that no one could tell which was the least ugly. Now one day, the man at the livery stable. Where the master kept his horse, said that he wanted a cat because the rats were giving him a great deal of trouble in his hayloft. So the master took the ugliest cat of all, which was really ugly enough to frighten the crows, and he put her in a basket and took her away to the stable, and everybody was glad. But three days after, as the person was weeding the flower bed, she heard a loud squeal of joy and felt something rubbing against her back. She turns round, and there was the ugliest cat, purring and squeaking, and seeming just as glad to get back as if she were perfectly beautiful, and as if everybody loved her to distraction. She was sent to the stable again, but this time she came back the very next day, because she had found out the way. So she stayed. But after that, things went worse than ever. The person went out to walk. And a cat followed her home, and would not go away, and would come in. And Maggie, the cook, said she couldn't see the crather starve, so she fed it, and it stayed. And on Thanksgiving Day, a miserable, hungry kitten came to the door and begged to be let in. And nobody could refuse to give it a Thanksgiving dinner, so it came in, and it stayed. And now the person who does not like cats has nothing but cats about her all the time. They lie on the stairs and trip her up in the dark. If she takes up a clothes basket, out rolls a kitten. If she gets the little sleigh to take the little mistress to ride, out jumps a cat. Wherever she goes, whatever she does, she sees a dirty white cat, or a rusty black cat, or a faded yellow cat, or a dingy tabby cat. Or a hideous tortoiseshell beast, which is the ugliest cat of all, and the person would like the children to tell her what is to be done about it. End of the person who did not like cats. Recording by Cam Yao. End of five-minute stories by Laura E. Richards.